This is Jocko Podcast number 41 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. And tonight, we are lucky to have a guest on the podcast. My friend, my teammate, my brother, Tony Afratti. And I'm going to start the podcast by reading a speech that I wrote when Tony retired from the teams. And for whatever reason, some reason that I don't remember, if it was work or job or some travel or something, I couldn't actually be there to read this myself. And that's the way the teams is. You do your job. That's the priority. And I knew Tony would understand that I wouldn't be there and it would be no big deal to him. And I acted like it was no big deal to me. (laughs) But I wanted to be there and I should have been there. And I wrote a speech and I emailed it to one of our our friends, one of our bros, another SEAL Master Chief, and he read it there. But I should have been there to read it myself. And you will hear that this speech is kind of like Tony is. It's raw and straightforward and real. And so here's the speech that I wrote for Tony when he retired. Here we go. First of all, I apologize to Tony that I couldn't be there out in the desert today to see you off. And for those of you that are with him today, know this. Tony Afratti is a hero. A dirty, scrappy, rough, hard, mean bastard. But a hero. I've known him for over 20 years. And in those 20 years, I got to see him in many capacities. First, as a young, hardcore, beer-swilling, muscle-car-driving, machine-gunning, fist-fighting, third-class petty officer. Then, as an experienced, hardcore, Jack Daniels-swilling, fist-fighting, second-class, leading petty officer. Next, as a badass, hardcore, fist-fighting, knowledge-filled, first-class training cell instructor. And finally, as a SEAL platoon chief. And we all know that being a platoon chief is supposed to mean that you're hardcore. It's supposed to mean that you're experienced. It's supposed to mean that you're a tough bastard. It's supposed to mean that you're fearless. It's supposed to mean that you're a true leader of men. Unfortunately, we all know that that isn't always true. But with Tony... It's 100% true. Tony is without question the primordial SEAL chief, the ultimate senior enlisted leader. When I joined the teams, I joined to follow guys like Tony into unbridled combat, into the violent fray, into hell. I was lucky enough to work with Tony when he was one of the platoon chiefs in our task unit at SEAL Team 3 from 2005 to 2006. Task Unit Bruiser. We started our work up here in the desert, the true forging ground of frogmen. With a couple years on me, he was the oldest guy in the troop and therefore the primary representative of the old breed. And he represented the old breed with honor. He immediately proved that he was physically harder, mentally tougher, and operationally superior to any of the young bucks. Really. It was August, 115 plus degrees. He didn't get tired. He outshot everyone. He ran immediate action drills like Erwin Rommel. He didn't drink water. Seriously. Coffee in Copenhagen, that's it. And desert training was just the beginning. He led every evolution through the entire workup. Always coming up with the plan, always training and mentoring the new guys and everyone else. We trained and we trained hard. I drew a line in the sand. Tony held that line. We pushed 
the envelope in every evolution and prepared for war. Somehow, some way, we knew what the future held. We deployed to Ramadi, Iraq in April of 2006, and to our absolute joy, it was an embroiled war zone. We had been on the ground about a day when I went to meet the, br- the brigade commander. Tony was already out in the city in a sniper overwatch position. As I walked into the brigade tactical operations center and shook hands with the colonel, John Gronsky, he said, one of your snipers just killed an IED in place or up on racetrack where we lost four, four Marines three days ago. And that is exactly what he needed us to do. He needed us to kill them. That sniper was Tony. With the first kill of the deployment, strategic due to its timing, timing that opened up the entire battle space to task unit bruiser. And so we fought. And fought and killed the enemy by the bushel. And Tony was at the front the entire time. He never wavered, he never faltered, despite the heat, despite the danger, despite heavy casualties, he constantly pushed to get out over and over and over again to kill the savages that were determined to destroy America and coalition forces. He never asked for a pause or a break or a night off or a minute off. Everything that I ever asked of him, everything he did, and he did it with every ounce of commitment and drive and selflessness and professionalism that any human could ever muster. And we would talk and laugh and we would discuss what we could do better and we would come up with a plan and in the end, Tony would give me a head nod. And that head nod meant he had it. It was done. He owned it. And I never doubted that, ever. He never missed an operation and applied himself to each mission with solemn gravity as the senior enlisted leader. He poured over maps and imagery. He held detailed warning orders. He briefed the platoon with clarity and directness. He led rehearsals. He did everything he could do to be ready. And his platoon performed magnificently, accounting for hundreds of enemy killed. When his own men were wounded or killed in action, it only fueled his motivation to kill more of the enemy, to fight harder, to slaughter more of the evil, soulless enemy and rid the world of their wretched kind. That is what every SEAL should aspire to be like. In Tony's words, BTF. A big, tough frogman with no fear, no hesitation, and no mercy. Just BTF through everything, like Tony did. For Senior Chief Efrati's courage, determination, and leadership, I will be eternally grateful. I owe him more than I can ever repay him for what he did for me, for the task unit, for the teams, and for our great nation. Let there be no doubt. The man before you is a hero. The teams are a worse place without his presence, his guidance, his leadership, his example. Those that served with him must strive to carry the torch and pass it on so that his spirit burns bright in the teams forever. I recently watched a movie about Lemmy Killemeister, the lead, the leader of the original classic heavy metal thrash band Motorhead. The movie chronicles the life of Lemmy, the hard living rock and roll legend. The movie paints a picture of a unique individual that will never, that can never exist again. The movie is called Lemmy, 49% motherfucker, 51% son of a bitch. And that seems to suit Lemmy pretty well. And I'm not exactly sure how those numbers would break out for Tony, but I do know this. Tony Afratti is a 100% frogman. Always was and always will be. Tony, thanks for everything. I'll see you on the other side. BTF. Jocko. And with that, 
Tony, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks a lot, brother. <clears throat> kind of forgot about that there, and that was that was good. And the guy we're talking about read it pretty good too. And you know, I didn't have like a big ceremony or nothing. I just went out to Nylon and we got all gummed up, and that was about it. But uh, I do I appreciate it, man. Yeah, it's good to see you, brother. It's good seeing you too. And you know, actually, uh, when I told people that you were coming on the show, you know, people actually know who you are. From the Live to Tell. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, Leif, Leif's been on here. We talked about you, you know, told some stories and shit. Yeah. And so, uh, but a bunch of people had a bunch of questions. And, you know, I figured we'd try and get through some of them. We, we, we won't be able to answer all the ones that I got, but I picked out some of them and uh, let you take a look and pick out some of them. So, well, I mean, f- first and foremost, people just want to know kind of who the hell are you and where'd you come from? <laughs> Yeah, it's funny, uh, a few years back, like, uh, we're all in Arizona, and I took a bunch of the guys in a platoon over to my parents' house. You know, we had supper and everything, and it was wicked fun. Jeremy pulls me aside, and he's like, you actually have parents? I thought you were born under a rock somewhere in the desert. I'm like, shut up, you know? That's pretty funny. No, I'm, I'm from New Hampshire, and uh, I had... It's just probably like you. Just yeah. It's not so much wanted to be a seal. I just wanted to be something different. You know, I could have went like a biker gang or something just as easy. You know, yeah. but you know, I figured yeah, this. I have a pretty good chance of staying out of the clink. You know, this way, but you know, not always, but a few times. You know, <laughs> here and there. But the teams just suited me because everybody is the same. Everybody, you know, everywhere you look. Guys are doing what you would do, and they act how you would act, and it's not always great, but you know. So and you 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 got recruited though by some of the boys like over in the PI, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I wanted to be a CU, but I wasn't like a thousand percent, you know. And I was in the Philippines, and I was like, "All right, I got to <laughs> do that. That's it." So I went and got a screening test over there in Subic Bay, and you know, I smoked it, and then. You know, they didn't have this long pipeline back then. I, I got yeah. there on a Friday. We got all gooned up and shaved our heads on Sunday, and we started Monday. There was not That was it. Just, yeah. Okay, go. Yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, actually, I, I know uh, I was talking to the old Master Chief that actually was the guy that recruited you and told you you need to be a team guy. Yeah, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah me too. And I was talking to him the other day when you were down at his house on the phone. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, and he was one of my platoon chiefs, as you know. But I told him. I told him the best thing he ever did for the teams was get you to join the teams. That's what I <laughs> and he was laughing. Yeah, he probably, probably, well, definitely the best thing for you. You know, oh, saved yeah. your I ass mean, from all kinds of trouble. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but it's just, you know, it's, it's the teams, like, between us, we got probably 46 years of team guy life. And, mm-hmm. and uh, it's so hard to put in perspective if you don't know what you're talking. You know, you've never been there. Yeah. You know, people, like, People don't know that we don't call each other SEALs. Yeah, yeah, you, know, yeah. you never say that. You never. Yeah. Nobody says, when I joined Navy SEALs. Yeah. You know, it's like, <laughs> when I became a team guy. Yeah. You know, if I, you say that, everyone just like turn their head and go, you retarded? Yeah. I mean, come on. It's really weird when you hear a team guy refer to being a Navy SEAL. <laughs> yeah. It, it actually makes you think, well, oh, wait, wait a second. Who, this guy must not have actually been in the team. Yeah, okay. What well, class are you in? Yeah. Immediate interrogation, yeah. like, with, with your hand cocked behind your back. Like, I'm just going <laughs> to... It's gonna hit him so hard, give his driver's license a black eye. You know? Yeah, I don't know where that. I don't know where that comes from. Like where we right. don't say it. I, I guess maybe it's. I know when I got the team one, it, it was like, oh, you don't talk about it. Yeah, you don't, yeah. You don't say it. No. Yeah, I know. No, no stickers. No T-shirts. No, yeah. not, no. You don't do any of that. <laughs> I'm sure all the punishable, all the, punishable by death. Yeah, yeah. You don't, you don't say anything. Well, we all thought we were going to, to Vietnam the next day. You know, <laughs> you know. You think, oh my god. And after a while, you're like, all right, what's happening here? Yeah. You know, what's going on? <laughs> Good. All right, man. Well, so that's Tony. Grew up in New England, like me. And you know, did you ever hear this that? They spent a bunch of money trying to figure out who's oh, yeah. the I know. training. I know. And the only, literally, the only Hooligans, two things wasn't it? they got was uh, guys that wrestled and guys from New England. That, yeah. And it wasn't like a big difference, but you know, 
a, a normal person has a 26% chance of making it through, and someone from New England had like a 37 or something, like a small uptick. I, think I mean, I, you know what? I, I think also that there's good people out on the country, don't get me wrong, but New England has a pretty strong work ethic. You know what I mean? True. Yeah, and yeah. I've seen that a lot, a lot, and yeah. uh, not that other people don't. Yeah, but all the guys, most of the guys I knew from New England and the teams had a pretty good work ethic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's just cold too. Yeah, it just is. so that cold. doesn't help though. Yeah. That doesn't matter. I, I mean, think it does because I I thought guys from Florida in my class like there was these kids from Florida. There was a couple kids from Florida. And they were, you know, all loud and like they were just big tough guys. Yeah. Like they were already in the teams basically in their own minds and they all quit. I know. I was like, well, well, I guess like the I... first day of Buds, I'm looking around some of these guys and I'm like, wow, holy crap. These guys are like insane shape yeah. and all this stuff. Yeah. I'm still a little hungover from the plane ride <laughs> from the PI, you know, like, yikes. <laughs> and I'm not, you know, I made it. And yeah. it was like, they didn't. <laughs> yeah. It's Can't weird. tell. It's weird. You know? you know, they just had this kid, uh, that quit buds and then he went and jumped off of a hotel down in san diego killed himself and i looked at a picture where he missed the pool or something <laughs> no there was no pool to jump in though he killed himself wow. and uh was, he did it right i guess yeah, you know? he succeeded but i was looking at him i was talking to uh one of the guy, a guy that we know who's an instructor over there and i was looking at a picture of the dude and the dude was like this strapping guy all buff with yeah. like blonde yeah. hair yeah. and just looked like a total <laughs> stud and i go man that guy looked like a stud what happened and then the instructor guy said dude they all look like that now like know, everybody's just you know it's a big deal hey i'm gonna go in the seal teams i'm gonna go in the seal teams and that's what they're saying so their recruiting is really easy but they're recruiting all these studs well but it doesn't matter the attrition rate stays matter. the same yeah that's why you know you know that the government wants more and more team guys yeah. so it just ain't gonna happen no it's not not unless you lower the standards and if that happens then we've all not done our job yeah, yeah. that's just terrible awesome all right get some of these questions here um it says here on the first podcast with Leif, you discussed a story in which Tony came up with a strategy for an op, and and Tony told Leif would be better. The brief would be better coming from Leif, and it says, "Where did you develop this humility and this characteristic of not worrying about individual credit versus team objectives?" So that to rehash that story yeah. real quick, it was real. We were out at we were out at the desert training facility, and we were just planning. You were planning some like you know when we do iteration training, we just yeah. got go do yeah. nothing. Okay, yeah. go do. It was just one of those, and they changed the target or something and you're like okay here's what we need to do put guys over here put an overwatch over here and walk through online like this and lace like hey sounds good to go why don't you get the guys over and brief them and you said hey sir you know what you go ahead and brief them that way it sounds better coming from you and that'd be the way to do it and he was like well all right you know he was he was fired up and i when i saw you do that i was like because because this is the thing and i forgot to mention this you and i have known each other for a long time we we're both a team forever. together and and we had the same friends and we hung out at the same places <laughs> yikes <laughs> yikes <laughs> but we were never in a platoon together no nope. we were never nope. in a platoon together and never worked together like directly together until we were in tasking a bruiser so when Correct. i got to nyland i knew your reputation which was which was rock solid but I don't trust anybody about anybody. So no, I was cuss not. Like, yeah, I'm cuss but, not. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so I just, you know, so I'm seeing you kind of for the first time out there of actually working, and you know that was a big indicator to me. I was like, damn, you know, this guy is totally humble. Wants to make his officer look good. Wants to make his, which is only going to make the platoon better. It's only going to make everybody better. So, yeah, that was awesome. And what a great attitude to have. And I get asked that all the time. People say, you know, my boss is, is doing this. And what should I do? I'm like, well, give him support. Try and help him. Yeah. Try and make him look good. But the thing that's chewing away at people is their ego of them wanting the credit. Right. And you right. see this. I mean, we see this all the time in SEAL teams. So anyways, where did you realize that? Did anybody teach you that? Or where the hell did you, how the hell did you know to do that? I, I can read and watch people pretty good. And I watch some guys who kind of, brought me up in the teams some of the guys we were talking about earlier yeah. and i just tried to kind of mimic them but then it kind of morphs into your own mm -hmm. shit you know no yep. and uh well yeah the first thing is i was just tired and my voice was gone i just wanted him to do it <laughs> <laughs> no i'm just kidding but <laughs> so tired <laughs> so tired <laughs> but uh yeah like get over there boss and do your job but I mean, some of them guys in that 
that platoon, they were already my chums, like Chris Kyle and Bob and Jeremy. Them guys yep. have been around a while. Yep. And they already, you know, I put them through training in yep. land warfare on Nylon. Mm-hmm. So they, they're, they've known me, yep. you know, and up to that point, it's been, I was doing a lot of that shit. And I'm like, no, boss, you do it. Because mm-hmm. basically, he's new yeah. to them. Yep. Not new in the teams, but he was new. And I, I figured, he's got to do this more and more and more. Yeah. You know, and he, and he did. Of course, you know, Leif stepped up like a, like a you know, gangbusters. Mm-hmm. He was a great officer. But in that, in that beginning stages, like, all right, I've already done this a million times. I don't... <laughs> I don't care. I'm good. You know, you want my advice? Great. But come on, let's just get the ball rolling. Nice. Do it. And so if that answers the question. Yeah. No, that, that was, uh, and again, that was always the attitude you had, which was you never cared about looking good yourself. And part of that is you just had such a good reputation in the teams that what are you going to do? Look even better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to get another Navy calm or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, but. You know, a lot of people, so if you're listening and you're wondering, you know, what makes what makes somebody a good, like a good NCO, I know there's a lot of Marines, a lot of soldiers listen to this, what makes a good NCO, you don't always have to make yourself shine. You don't always have to be the guy that's the center of attention. And as a matter of fact, generally, that shines through as being a guy that wants to be the center of attention yeah. instead of a guy that wants to have a good platoon. And it's so. not like I was doing it to make rank. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't expect to make E five. Never mind, senior chief. <laughs> God. Uh, all right. Next question. Please detail the way you were able to use decentralized command when running task unit bruiser and how it was met through the other commanders. So, for those of you that don't know, decentralized command means you're going to let your subordinate leadership lead, and you're not going to micromanage everybody. And that's definitely. What I did, and I didn't micromanage. Well, I should I should rephrase that. If people need to be micromanaged, I'll micromanage them. If right, they're jacked right. up, I'm going to be all in them. Right, and exactly. like you're talking about with Leif and with Seth and, or with uh, the other platoon, the Delta platoon commander, I micromanaged those guys like crazy when we first got in. Yeah. Because I was just making sure they were good to go. Just because right. they weren't that experienced and just like guys that just don't trust anybody when you don't know them. Yeah. And then, uh, but the goal was to just have them be able to run on their own and make stuff happen. Cause I'll tell you another thing you can't, you can't run everything yourself. No. Nobody no. can. No. And so you got a decentralized command and that's what I did was I let, you know, when, when we got on deployment, I wasn't micromanaging anything. I was barely, I was just kind of broad guidance, you know, right, of course. And then, Cuss. and then, you guys were running the stuff and making things happen. I mean, I would have loved to be on every operation, <laughs> but I physically couldn't because we had multiple yeah. ops going on. We had to split forces. So what are you going to do? I got no problems with anyone in that group. The lowest guy running an op. Yep. yep. But you got you got to let you you got to let the boys basically screw up because mm-hmm. then you don't know how they're going to react. Okay, do they just sit there and pout? Me, and then you got to slap them or whatever. Or do they, okay, here's what you did wrong. Roger that. And then immediately start thinking how to fix it. Because everybody fucks up everything. Let's face it. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were never g- always good at anything. Still ain't really good at much. It was BTF through it all. And so it doesn't <laughs> seem like we made mistakes. I mean, really. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> yes, but leadership is funny because some guys take to it like water. And other guys are scared to death of it. Yeah. You know, lately I've been realizing that because people always say, you know, are leaders made or born? And can you make a person that's not a good leader into a good leader? And I look at it kind of like um, when you see these video games where people have different re- strengths and weaknesses. And, yeah, yeah. And yeah. a guy might be uh, strong and high intellect and good agility and, yeah. I don't know, yeah. whatever those games have. Fair posture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So with leadership, it's the same thing because there's certain elements, certain natural things that you can have that make you a good leader. For instance, this is a real simple one. Can you be loud? And in in, yeah. in the SEAL teams, if you can't be loud, that's going to be that's gonna be a problem. Like if, it you, is. if you can't just take control of a room and be like, you know, hey, everyone get in this room. Yeah, you know, yeah. If you can't do that, people can't hear you, then you got to find a way around that. Right. Are you articulate? Can you simplify things that are complex? Because there's all these little things that you get ranked, you basically all ranked at. 
And some guys have they were born with low rankings, and they either find a way to make up for them, they learn how to do them better, or they compensate by using somebody else. You know, if like I wasn't loud, I'd be like, "Hey, Tony, tell everyone to get in here." Then you could do it, right? Right. Uh, that but, makes total sense, though. I yeah. Mean, if, if if someone out there is a leader, been in a leadership position, you know exactly what you're talking about. Yep. Yep. And then sometimes it's you know. Hey, what's the problem? No, really, what's the problem? Well, uh, okay, like you said, good, good. All right, now you identified it. Go work it out. Mm-hmm. Don't sit around and cry about it. And just go do it, you know, and then you got five minutes. Yeah, yeah. Go take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> I think the other thing with decentralized command that's, that's important is for everybody to know what the limits are, like how far you can go in right. one direction or another. Yeah. And I know that. You know, like I always trusted you guys were going to do the right thing. Well, like you said early on in that workup, you know, leadership at every level. You know, even the junior guy, it's his responsibility to keep me in check if something's going wrong. Because mm-hmm. if I'm doing something stupid, he's like, hey, Tony, what? what oh, yeah. Okay, I lost it there for a while. Because, <laughs> you know, hey, sometimes I'm old. Sometimes I lose it once in a while, you know, and I'm not going to apologize. <laughs> yeah, nice. Anything else on decentralized command? Well, it's it's a lot easier if you start right from the beginning trying to make everybody understand decentralized command because that's the goal. Yep. It has to be the goal because someone like you, 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 you can't. You got to be somewhere else. You know, we... We didn't want you on the battlefield with us. I wanted you on the battlefield with me. Every time you were, I was like, oh, this is awesome. But, I mean, I really, really needed you back where you were. Of course. You know, and that it was, it, everybody had a like wicked high level of confidence just knowing that you were back there, taking care of, watching her back, you know, and never sleeping <laughs> and just doing like 40 pull-ups and sweating and then trying to eat everything in the camp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it the, the thing that you talk about as far as getting everyone to know that and understand that from the beginning is is for sure. Oh yeah, I mean everybody's got to know that, man. You, you know, I I I don't want like my favorite thing is I go out on an operation with you guys and not do anything. No, you just, just a shooter. sit around, You're just a shooter. Just, oh, okay, I'm just in the train. All the yeah. you know that's <laughs> that's the way it should be because. The leaders are leading because Leif is doing his job. He's leading the assault. Right. He's leading right. things. The the breach team is doing their stuff. And I'm just like, okay, cool. I'm basically an observer, you yeah. know. To, now To some, a point. Yeah. Then you're like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always did that a little issue. <laughs> but, uh, but that's the way you want it, you know. And, and then when something does happen, you can then handle it. You can step in and go, okay, hey, guys, we need to back off over here. Right. Hey, this is, this is going right. wrong. And, and that's the way it should be. So if that's your goal, though, is to say, look, I want my leaders to lead. I don't want to be doing all their job for them. When, first of all, that'll make them more confident. It'll make them more capable. And then when something does happen they, and they need your assistance, you're not bogged down with something else. You can step in and make it happen. Right. I think it's uh, take like Iraq or Afghanistan. That's why the combat vets coming back and they talk about decentralized command. It's important because... If you're just doing the same like army training and an army unit goes over there, what are they going to do? Go, all right, guys, now we're doing decentralized command later. You know, you, you know, until that happens, you know, you got to, now they come back. Hey, we need to train like this. Yep. Here's what our junior officers need to do. Here's what our NCOs need to do. Here's our E5s, our E4s, you know, our privates. Here's yep. what they need to do. Yep. But. Good. All right. Next up, uh, Talk about some failures in planning leadership and how you built back up. Yeah, we didn't. We had none of that. Everything went perfect. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things that I think of when, I, and I guess this isn't really a failure, but we would oftentimes make a decision, and then in a day or in a week, decide, yeah, that wasn't a good call. You know, right, do something right, else. And right. I think a good example of that is how we kind of task organized and we split up into different groups and be like, okay, you guys are running this area. You guys are running this area. And then yeah. like two weeks later, actually, no, this area is not good. We're going to move the guys. We're right. going to join them back together. I I always felt like everybody, especially us in the leadership, you know, right. we were all like, okay, cool. Yeah. We just made a mistake. We just move on. Not, not even a mistake, but 
you got to change. You got to adapt. Yeah, you got to. You got to morph into something. It's like if you're doing unilateral ops, then it's, it's kind of a no brainer. If you go over there and all of a sudden, you know, all you, you're working by yourself, boom, boom, doing your missions, great. But if you're working split forces and you're training indigenous forces and you're doing that, you have to have these, you know, you have to, and it's not always easy to adjust for because it's like there's a world of difference between Iraq and Afghanistan. Like a world of difference. I mean, it's all kind of the same, but stuff I did in Iraq, I didn't do in Afghanistan, you know, and vice versa. Like, whoa, we can't do that. You know, and even... Even stuff like the weather, you know, talking you know, all of a sudden it's snowing, you know, and then the terrain. Like people think Iraq's all desert. I mean, there were some places where they were like in the jungle. Mm-hmm. It's like we were in Nam, you know, or Cambodia, for <laughs> Christ's sakes. And like, well, we wouldn't, you know, okay, we're gonna walk how many clicks? Yeah, well, when you're up to your waist in mud, you know, all of a sudden that time frame is totally off because yep. we didn't. You know, made a mistake. I didn't really, really read the terrain. Yep. You know, and yep. ask about it and yep. see who's been up there before and shit. But yeah. yeah. So, but we just adapt and overcome. Yeah, exactly. Not, I think that's the biggest you thing. Learn from your mistakes. Yeah. When it comes to failure, it's just okay. What do good. we do now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. Okay. Let's let's adapt and move on. Yeah. All right. Um. Next one. I really want to hear you talk about. The battlefield and how it made you feel. And the type of situations when the shit hits the fan. Well, that kind of question's pretty easy for me. Like how the battlefield made me feel. All I can say is it made me feel much better than any other place than the battlefield. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because everything makes sense on the yeah. battlefield. Very. We're either going forward or we're getting, going away or defending our position or we're moving out. Yeah. Out of that, what else is there? Because yeah. all them things, even if you have men down and people wounded, you still got to do them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> as I sit here and think about this, so our op tempo was very high. Meaning the operational tempo, yep. though, for those of you that don't know what that means, it means like how often you're doing work. And the, the op tempo was very high. And so, but sometimes for whatever reason, let's say an operation would get canceled or pushed back, and all of a sudden Tony would have been in camp for like two days. Right. Well, the second day, <laughs> like the first day, he'd be, you know, okay, he's coming up with a plan, he's looking yep. for something else, you know, him and Leif are trying to figure something out to do. But then the sec by the second day, he's just. Just starting to get all frustrated yeah, and pace like, around what are we the doing here. Well, well, hey, is this is just stupid. Yeah. Oh, what's next? <laughs> We're gonna go to like the big bass and like country music concert or something. I'm so, serious. Like when I was in oh, Afghanistan, yeah. I flew into uh, uh Kandahar. Yeah. And these guys are like, Oh, you just missed I can't remember what country stuff. They go to concerts and stuff. Yeah. I'm eating rat shit and <laughs> stuff up in the mountains. You know, I'm like, really? What are all these people doing here? Why aren't you out murdering the bad guys? <laughs> God. Yeah, so, Tony, you would get very frustrated after like two days, and then you'd just come in, and I'd say, okay, dude, I'll be here, just go to this area and go find something to do, and then you'd go make a plan, and you and Leif would come back. All right, we got something. We're going to go get it. But you got you to admit, though, uh, you know, time off is not such a good thing. I mean, a couple days break, yeah, yeah now and then, but you got to keep the boys busy. Yeah. Then they start thinking, then they start getting, you know, but I mostly did it for me because I just wanted to get after it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's definitely, you, you can nah. smoke them, but uh, you're right. If all of a sudden they're sitting around all the time, they, you know, what's that, uh, a body in motion tends to stay at motion and a body at rest right. tends to stay at rest. So if you start lagging and all of a sudden you're going to go do an op and everyone's kind of, there's resistance. There's yeah. not, not, not verbal resistance, just, just like you a shrug the shoulders. Just like, like, mm. just like a resistance, a, a, some unseen resistance in the world that <laughs> wants you to slow down. But when the shit hits the fan, you know, it's, it's strange because it makes me, like a little calmer, I think. Mm. I mean, not always. I had the first first time I ever got shot. I was a little jittery, a little bit, but you know, well, I, oh I, my god, what's going on? Actually, I I, I knew what it was. You know, it's not like, <laughs> oh, what's that? Actually, I, I actually remember you were uh, 
briefing some of the guys when we when when we were back, and you, you were like, um, you were like, hey, you know what? We didn't work on training when when I when we went through training and we were getting ready to go to Ramadi. We didn't work on 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 this right here. Oh my god, what's yeah. happening? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's this too. Oh wow, this is gonna be cool. Yeah, till all that bad stuff starts. Then they're screaming, yelling, <laughs> diving into shit, and shooting and killing, and but you know, it's kind of it is fun. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the thing I've said on here before is that the battlefield and all these situations, they just give you this clear focus in life right. that nothing else gives you. No. Well, nothing that I've found Me gives either. you this. Like, oh, we're going to kill people or going to get killed ourselves. That's everything in the world. Right. Nothing right. else matters. No. That's it. Just like sitting in camp watching TV. That doesn't matter. No. <laughs> okay, you got your rest. Okay, you good? <laughs> you know <laughs> all right you know let's go uh, <laughs> all right next one not to take away from the seriousness of what you two have achieved in the seals but i would like tony to tell a funny story about jocko and the reason i put this one in here uh of course, I don't like to hear any humor or any laughter in the world, <laughs> but there was a bunch of people that oh, that said this. So, uh, anyways, I figured you might have a story. Or... I got like, <laughs> like seriously, like a million, like a million. I mean, <laughs> that story about you and your roommate, like you're, uh, you're like, <laughs> you guys live together in Coronado. Yeah, you know what I'm talking yeah. about the big fella. Yeah, <laughs> you're like. I was over there partying one night. We we're getting gooned up, and you're like, "You know what our our bill was from Domino's? <laughs> it was like twenty five hundred dollars last month. Yeah, in a month. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was so funny. That's some uh, wicked good parties, though. Yeah, yeah, we did have some pretty good parties. <laughs> and then one time we we're out at uh, Nyland. And it's a, it's like two o'clock in the morning, and the guys are, you know, they're uh, what do you t- what do you call that? After you're done, do the work on the vehicles. Uh, post, you know, post up the vehicles. Post up in the vehicles, and they're all busy doing stuff. And I mean, I'd help out if I had to, but I mean, that's not my job. Yeah. So, and they boys know what to do. Jeremy had him. Great LPO, and uh, we're sitting there, me, you, and Leif, and maybe one of the other JOs, and we're <laughs> shooting the shit about something. I mean, I had to do a work because yeah. what else is there? And Leif was talking, and it was quiet, kind of, and you you got your arm on one of the Humvees, and all of a sudden, you just, out of nowhere, you just kick the dirt, and you go, God damn it! <laughs> and you're, like, shaking your head and clenching your fist, and I'm like, the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> and he just, like, looked at me and smiled and walked away, like, what? <laughs> what? What is wrong with you? <laughs> Still haven't figured out what was wrong with you. Actually, I, see, I, 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 I know what, I, I remember you that. You just went, God damn it! Yeah, no, I was actually getting frustrated that there was a chance we might not go to Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> and like I was so uh, s- scared and horrified of of that. It just, you know, and I just was trying to control it, but then it just kind of slipped out. Uh, here's another quick one about Jacko. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, we were there a couple weeks in Ramadi, and we're just falling into our groove operating, and one night I was in his office because like couldn't sleep or whatever, <laughs> and uh, he's like, "Look at this!" And he showed me, he shows me the computer. He goes, "This is from my wife." <laughs> hey, are you okay? You've been gone three weeks and we haven't heard anything from you. <laughs> I'm like, chum, you better you better email your wife or she's gonna fly over and kill you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I. Uh... Mm, yeah, I talk about detachment a lot, and uh, <laughs> sometimes you know, like I said, sometimes you get over there and you got all that shit going on, and uh, nothing else in the world matters. But I didn't have anything going on back here; yeah. it didn't matter to me at all. <laughs> mm. Sorry uh, t- uh, to my wife there uh, for not. <laughs> she, I'm sure she remembers that with you in any way. <laughs> you did though. You're like, okay, I got it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Here's one. What made you realize one of your guys was really good to go or was not up to standard 
not necessarily big things, but micro actions or decisions that set something off in your mind? Well, I had a lot of guys work under me over the years, and, and I mean, I really think that, you know, all my brothers and the teams, every one of them is good to go. Even the guys I didn't get along with, I'd still give my wife for them in a second. doesn't matter. But uh, one thing that sticks out to me was Biggles. But it was Ryan Job. Is you know I I don't I guess I could have been more like ooh, nice or whatever, but I'm like, man, you look like you're fucking fat. You better get in fucking shape, bro. I'm gonna I'm gonna fucking kill you. I'm not gonna like write you up. I don't even know how to do that. I'm gonna I'm gonna just physically kill you. And man, you know I didn't even know if he was in good shape or not because some people you can't tell. Yeah, and they're like, look at that guy, and then. He just knocks shit uh, out. Yeah, people that are iron marshmallow. Yeah. <laughs> and, man, that kid did. I mean, he really, really did. And, like, all of a sudden, I'm like, chum. Well, I didn't say that. I was like, hmm. I, you know, so I was like, yeah. That was, like, my praise. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, whatever. You're High good. praise from Okay, on the next one. On to the next thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, but, I mean, that was really good. And, you know, I remember one of my guys... Uh, Lost a piece of equipment one time, and, you know, I was kind of upset with him, but it just made me realize that, you know, if we're making a mistake, maybe it's not this guy's fault. Maybe it's my fault. Maybe it's everyone's fault as a, as a team. Because at the end of the day, it's all of us. So maybe we ought to take a day or two off, you know, and that kind of helped. And, you know, we handled it, but, I mean, and another one of my guys, he... uh it was Christmas, and he left left a piece of equipment open, or he didn't lock something. And I mean, it wasn't a big deal. I could have corrected it right there, but the guys had just taken off on Christmas leave, and I was had nowhere to go, so I was drinking beers in the team area. So I just walked around checking shit out, and sure enough, so I called a guy, and he was like three or four hundred miles into his drive to a western state for Christmas. I'm like, he goes, "Oh, I'm sorry." I'm like, "Yeah, no problem, man." All right, so turn around now, and I'll be waiting for you. And there's dead silence on the phone. He's like, what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he drove all the way back, and I was standing there. It was like 4 in the morning now, and I was like, I was pretty liquored up by then and just fuming. But he's like, hey, I'm sorry. Are you learning a lesson? Yep. Okay, have a good leave. And I'm sure, I'm positive he never did that again. That'll do it. You know, yeah, it was kind of a dink move, I guess, but, you know, I figured it was a thing to do. He who suffers remembers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, the, 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 the SEAL teams, when you're, when you're just working with guys all the time, you definitely start to pick up things and you can indicate okay yeah this guy's this guy's stepping up you know that's what i always noticed when when things are going sideways like in a training operation and you see a guy that's starting to step up you know that was always a good sign to absolutely me, you know absolutely like he's gonna he's gonna handle something it's like that's when you train decentralized command that's yep. where you gotta let guys make mistakes and screw things up because you, you know the less you you know the more you're sweating training the less you bleed more no doubt about that one all right um next one Tony, were there situations while in Iraq when you disagreed with a leadership decision made by Leif or Jocko? If so, how did you express your disapproval and were you successful in getting your point across? Um, most of the time, 99% of the time. No, I did not. Uh, there was one big one that I really disagreed with you guys on when my, uh, my request to keep the entire troop there for another year... <laughs> You said you couldn't, and I, I was tried. like, why not? And you're like, we can't, and I'm like, why? Well, And I was really, really, really angry about that, but... <laughs> yeah, I think I think this this question here is, is, is from someone that's thinking, that doesn't really understand how we're working, you know? And the, the bottom line is, I'm not coming down and going, all right, men, this yeah, is I what know. I want you I to know. do now. No. Yeah. We would just form our own yeah, operations. It's just all we're forming our own operations. Yep. We're all kind of bouncing ideas off each other. The best idea rises to the top. I don't care who it came from. I don't care if it came from me, Tony, from one of the new guys. It doesn't matter to me where the idea comes from or where the plan comes from. 
I want the best idea to rise to the top. And that's one of the best things about our troop was there was no one that was like trying to drive their own right, personal right, plan. I right. didn't care. No, I neither, literally didn't neither. care. And I think part of it is like you and me just had planned so many operations <laughs> and it just, you know, we just didn't care. It's like, oh, that's cool. You, you, you yeah. That sounds like a good plan. You know, maybe make this adjustment, maybe make that adjustment. Other than that, cool, let's execute it. Yeah. So I think that's a little bit different than um, than what people would envision as like I was the commander and right, I, or right. or because we're just not operating like that. Now this is why I've said to people very flat. Even though there's even though the the military and the SEAL teams there's definitely a hierarchical structure. I mean that's the way it's organized. There's a the troops and then there's you know, leading petty officers, and then there's a platoon chief, then there's a platoon commander, then there's a a, a troop commander, a task unit commander, right. and there's a a, a team com- So there's a structure there. Cuts there is, yeah. But the, the, as far as how we actually come to plan and stuff like that, there's, yeah, I mean, some guidance, but we're working as a team to do that, and that's what... And, and I would say it's not always like that. In fact, I know it's not always like that because I saw other platoons and other troops act and do different ways. But, I mean, we did operations that came from our commanding officer, yep, SEAL yep, Team 3, came yep. all the way down. Yep. And, and some of them were yeah. wicked good ops. Except <laughs> they'd give the maybe the mission objective, but they wouldn't be telling us, like, go in here. And, no, but no, no. We, we would never. Well, that's not the way it works. So yeah. I think that, uh, I mean, the situations when you disagreed with me was probably – in one hand, you could say never. In the in other hand, you could say a million times. Yeah, you were yeah. like, no, man, we shouldn't do that. And I'd be like, well, why not? Oh, we should put the vehicles in there. Oh, okay, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So yeah, right. that's that's how we voiced it, by saying, oh, yeah, let's do this. And I'd say, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, that's good. Sounds yeah. good. All yeah. Right. Good. <laughs> no big. Uh, no. Big, no. big uh, what's that? Like a big soap opera leadership struggle? Right. No, no, not ever. Not happening. It <laughs> <laughs> never happened. And uh, so if you don't have that kind of relationship with people, number one, is it your own ego that's getting involved? Because that's probably that's a, that's a good indicator. If you're like, well, you know, the my subordinates just don't understand. Oh, right. oh really? Yeah. Really? Why not? Oh, okay, why not? Well, maybe you suck as a leader then. <laughs> just do it like good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> maybe maybe if you did better, they yeah. wouldn't they wouldn't yeah. understand the mission more. <laughs> so. Pretty flat organization we had, at least from a planning perspective. Yes, sir. All right. If you had to pick one driving characteristic that separates a dominant alpha team guy from everyone else, what in the teams, what is it? Well, if guys in the teams, you got to know this, but a lot of people out there don't. That like pretty much everyone's an alpha male. You know, they don't. It's like. Nobody gives up the argument ever, you know, and usually it's, you know, wrestling or fighting and it's, it, it, it always works itself out. But I think uh, one thing I we were talking about is gimmicks. Like a lot of people in the teams, I call it a gimmick. Everybody's good at everything pretty much and does the job. But some people are like just insane skydivers. Some guys are just phenomenal rock climbers. Some guys are just like swimming sons of guns you know or runners and wrestlers and fist fighters and there's you know some people are just in the guns i mean that's their passion some people are just phenomenal divers you know and i was i was always pretty good at everything but not great you know i couldn't outrun everybody i couldn't outfight everybody i couldn't outswim everybody i couldn't outshoot everybody and i just i i think mine was like tactics and just being as hard as I could, and it, it, it I, had, I may have made it look easy, but it wasn't. Especially as I got older, it's no fun being a team guy when you're 44, you know, and you get up and you're like, ah, all right, yeah, okay. Then I'm like, I better retire. I'm done with all this. But yeah, if that if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, and the other funny thing about that is um, because in the teams. No team guy ever wants to give any credit to a different team guy. So if someone was like, "Hey, you know that that guy's a really good shot," and then someone yeah. immediately, be like, oh, yeah, yeah, hey, you ever he doesn't know how to swim though." Yeah, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, we used to <laughs> talk like, about always that. Always, just like someone's always ready yeah. to just. You know, no one's good at everything. Wow. <laughs> did, did did you work? You know, did you? And if they can't figure something out, they'll be like, 
whatever, fuck that guy. <laughs> <laughs> They'll just walk away. But, hey, where, where you going? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, uh, you know, one thing I'll say that is pretty cool, and I, I already brought this up, like one of the things that that separate, like w- w- when I worked with you that first time and I saw you like being humble, I was like, man, that's that to me is the characteristic that you can tell the guy is not just a good team guy but an awesome team guy when he's humble about what's going on. And when I was putting guys through training, and I know you saw this too, the guys that would come through training that thought they were all badass and thought they couldn't do anything wrong, they were always bad. Like they never yeah, did a good yeah, job. Right, right. And then the guys that were say, "Hey, man, I'm you know I'm looking forward to this training. I know we need we need to get tuned up and and uh let, you know let me do, know what I can do better." Those guys, when they were taking notes. They always kicked ass. They always yeah. did a good job. Yeah. So that being humble is uh, well, being humble too is. I I read a bunch of after action reports, you know, in my tours over there about different situations, different things, and every time they were well written by some guys, but it was. You'll always carry this. You will always do this. Never do this. Always do that. And I kind of took that into account when I wrote a, like a serious after action report for that deployment. Mm-hmm. I wish you would have saved it too because it was pretty good. Yeah. So first and I, foremost, this is what worked for us in these months, this environment, this temperature with this mission set and what we had to do. Don't use this as... Oh, he said that, so I'm going to do it every time. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, use it as a guide. It, every, everything in the teams is a toolbox. You pick it out when you need it, and you use it, and you put it back away. And if it sits in there for 500 years, it's still worth having because the time you pull it out, you're going to really need it. Yep, yep. You know? Next one. In the teams, what were the biggest reputation builders or killers? And for those of you who don't know, in the teams, and I guess it's the same anywhere, but it definitely is true in the teams. Man, your reputation is uh, is everything. It's everything. And people know who you are. They know if you do something stupid, and like really stupid in the teams. It's, everybody knows everybody it one knows second. It, everybody knows it forever. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, if you have an accidental discharge, meaning, meaning if you shoot your gun when you weren't supposed to, and there may be some scenarios where there's a little bit of leeway on that. But if you just do it in a dumb situation, everybody's going to know about it forever. Yeah, and that's oh, just yeah. like, you might as well just get a tattoo on your forearm that says, hey, I had an AD yeah. on this date. Yeah. Yeah. If on your forehead. You, if you do something stupid, you know, something that gets get you in trouble, like just dumb, yeah, you're, you're probably going to just, everyone's going to know about it. They're always going to think yeah. about it. If you, get, if you get fired from a position... And you happen to not get kicked out of the teams. Uh, Everybody's gonna. Everybody know. knows. You might it. as well just get out. Yep. <laughs> yeah. It's 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 a tough community when it comes to reputation. It's a really oh, tough it's, community. It's, it's really brutal. it's it's <laughs> wicked brutal. Like yeah, yeah, you know every it's like a small town. Yeah. Everybody knows everything, even though you're on other coasts. Yep. yep. I mean, I've done a lot of stupid shit in my career, and I was a jerk off and dumb dumb stuff and been an idiot, and everybody knows all that. Yeah. You know, yeah. You I mean, know, most of the stuff that you did, fortunately, is kind of uh, is like on the okay side. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't, yeah I don't know. Right, I don't know how to explain right, this, but like, yeah. oh, oh yeah, Tony got drunk and got in a fight at this thing. Yeah, you're yeah. like, oh yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's almost you know made a big that. spectacle at the big <laughs> to do with the uniforms and stuff. <laughs> Wouldn't it have like to do with? Like the things that you kind of can't do or you can't get away with or it'll affect your reputation in a bad way wouldn't it have more to do with how good of a team guy you are. You know what? You're right. You just just called it. You know what it has to do with? Is it something that that helped or is it something that is operational or not? Yeah. So if it's something that's operational. Everybody knows. Like if you, I mean, even like you'll hear about a guy that gets lost in buds in, 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 you, or like gets lost going through the initial training, but when he got to the team, he gets on land on land navigation and gets lost and yeah. has to get rescued. Bro, that's <laughs> yeah, just gonna yeah, it's just gonna stick with yeah. you forever. Yeah, yeah. Like they, like I remember, you know, I remember getting like three briefs about some guy that I was getting in a platoon about where this guy got lost, how stupid it was. <laughs> you know, there was a highway. He could have walked the highway. Yeah. You could hear the cars. Everyone just made a spectacle out of this kid. And I mean, the kid got out because eventually you go, man, I just can't. I mean, this is horrible. Yeah. Everybody just thinks I can't. <laughs> and so, yeah. So this question is actually, 
is actually a decent question because that definitely does play a big thing. So for me, and it's the basis for a lot of nicknames huh. on the team. True. True. You know? <laughs> True. Yeah. If you do something that's um, excessively stupid yeah. or, or or just have bad luck, like one of my favorite ones is Bush. You know Bush? A cuss. Yeah. But he, he like was parachuting and when he first got to the teams as a new guy and, he, and in his parachute, he landed in uh, in uh, what kind of bush was it? Just uh, <laughs> some kind of a bush with thorns and whatnot yeah, in his yeah. parachute got all tangled up and he got was stuck in there. <laughs> the guy's, so that's his name. No, he's great too. Yeah. He's an awesome, awesome guy. Dude. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> bush. Landed there's in the bush. The other funny bush. things, there's team guys where you don't even know what their real name was. Actually, I was kind of like that. Nobody knew what my actual name was. Mine yeah. was just Jocko and that was just, that was my civilian nickname that my parents gave me. But the funniest was there was a guy and... I'll just tell the story. There was a guy, and you know him. Of course I do. But, uh, but anyways, his name was Al. And I was always and like, his name. yeah, and I was like, you know, I knew it was Al. And then he was a heavy weapons instructor, so we called him Big Al, and then we called him Big Al 50 Cal. Yep. And it was Big like, Al 50 Cal. Big, Big Al 50, I knew Big Al 50 Cal for like eight years, right? And one day, I'm like, uh, you know, we're talking, and I we're doing some, we're going on a trip or something. I knew his name because I was in a couple platoons. Yeah, I did paperwork. Yeah, so so I I finally get to paperwork. I finally get to paperwork with him. This guy was also a real quiet guy. I mean, real professional, real quiet. Yeah, he's awesome. Just didn't say much. And uh, one day I'm doing the paperwork, and I go, "Hey man, I'm like looking at the list of people that's going." I go, "Hey man, I thought you were going on this trip with us." And he's like, "He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm going." And I go, "Oh, you're not on the manifest here." And he goes, "No," and he comes over, he points out his name. And his name is Keith. Yeah. And I go, I go, I go, bro, I go, well, your name is Keith. I go, you want me to, that's a mistake. You don't want me to get it changed? And he goes, no, no, that's my name. And I go, well, I thought your name was Al. I go, is Al your middle name? And he goes, he goes, no, Al's not my name at all. <laughs> and I go, I go, well, well, what do you mean? Why does every single person call you Al? And he goes, well, he goes, well, in my first platoon, well. I was out doing something. It was night, and I was, I guess I was looking around and moving my head a lot like an owl. <laughs> and so the guys started calling me Owl. And then over the next platoon, it changed from Owl, it just morphed into Owl, 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 owl. and then Owl, and then his name was Owl. And I literally would have told you this guy's name was Owl. And, and he never corrected it. He just said, you know, hey, whatever. You call me Owl, that's close enough. So I thought BF or somebody <laughs> named him that. I, 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 <laughs> so that's Big Al, 50 Cal. Uh, but you know what? His reputation was, because this is a question about reputation, his reputation was awesome because he was solid. He was a he was a former Marine, wasn't he? Uh, I, was he? No, that was 295. Oh, okay. 295 okay. was in the core. Uh, but, <laughs> but you know, solid reputation. So for me, and I, I guess, I mean, it's, it's what you do operationally yep. is what builds your reputation. And if you're a good shooter, if you're not, you know, shoot, shooting like an idiot, um, not, you know, if you can patrol well, if you have good field craft, all those things, the real things, that's right. what's kind of cool. That's what's kind of cool. That's one thing that's in the teams that's, that's hard for them to erase is yeah. what's your real reputation right. as a real team operator, guy, yeah. as an operator team guy. That's the thing that all these people that, that, kind of come and go in the teams and it's it's maybe it's not they're not real real team guys you can't fake that right. you know and when guys get some guys get shot blown up you know wounded and some of them can't operate anymore it's not like we throw them to the wolves if they want to stay in the teams we keep them and take yep. care of them yep. and some become phenomenal instructors and yep. and just go on and do great things you yeah know? i had the they were going to keep they if if Ryan Job would have wanted to stay, they were going to keep him. A cuss. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like, oh, oh, you're blind? Cool. Yeah, got so what? Of work for Great. You. Yep, Great. you can lead PT. You Doesn't can mean you can't stuff. listen to me when I say go do this. <laughs> 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 yeah, awesome. And and then contrary to that, obviously the killers are when you, uh, when you screw up stuff operationally. The other thing is, if you're an arrogant, egotistical guy, you'd be, everyone's going to hate you. That's, yeah, and you ain't going to last long. Because if you're, because you, there's some guys that are great skill wise they're great operators but they're horrible to work with they're arrogant yeah. they don't listen to anybody they're not humble and those guys will have a bad reputation too they got blinders on yeah. they can't yeah. open the you know and you got to if you want to evolve at all or yep. stay alive you know yeah yeah all right next one 
what makes a great NCO, and and for those of you not in the military, an NCO is a non-commissioned officer. The military is broken into two basic basic, uh, pathways of advancement and of existence. There's officers who are like the managers and the leaders, and then there's the enlisted guys, which are the grunts, but then as they get promoted through the ranks, you eventually become what's called the senior enlisted advisor and if you don't to kind of, if you think about Hollywood movies the way they always categorize these two is you've got the young junior officer fresh in Vietnam fresh out of the academy and then you got the salty old gunnery sergeant <laughs> that's the two that's the two so the ends the NCO is the is the enlisted side of that and uh NCOs they always say is like the backbone of the t- of the Marine Corps is the NCO. The the chiefs run the SEAL teams is the is the statement, right? Because the chiefs are the guys that the chiefs are the guys that'll be at a SEAL team, especially in the old days, be at a SEAL team for eight years. So you are the continuity and you get raised. So the question is what makes a great NCO and who is or was the best NCO you know? Well, for me, what makes a great NCO or a chief is I don't think you can just do it. I think it's, uh, I'm not saying I'm a great NCO, but I did have great NCOs who, who taught me a lot and they brought me up and they put their foot in, square in my rectum when I needed it. And they also took their time to explain things to me when they could see in my eyes. I was nodding my head, yes, but I was really, I didn't grasp it. And they're like, I'm going to do it this way. And they would, Work around my, for lack of a better word, learning disabilities. Because, I mean, some of the stuff you can't, you know, when you're a new guy, you're just like, yeah, yeah, yes, chief, or your chief. And they're like, no, dummy, relax. Here's how you do it. <laughs> and that leadership style went a long way with me. And uh, I never forgot it. You know, who's the best NCO you've had or ever known? Man, there's so many guys that, it's not one and I can't say their names because you know it's not cleared I mean but that's a good thing about nicknames sometimes you know I think uh, I'll have to say overall uh, Mr. Fack was probably the best one I ever had and uh, he was just an old school hot ass son of a bitch but he was fair as all hell he was fair and you always knew where you stood with him And I love that. That's what I tried to do later on. Like, I didn't want to go hide, 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 and then totally take another direction and just be, like, easy on the guys so they like me. You know, I don't care. And I thought that was much easier and a better way because mission men is how you should look at things. Put the mission first and take care of your men. But sometimes if you have to sacrifice men and you got to, like, okay, you got to die for this mission. All right, roger that. You know, because, I mean, that's the way the military is. That's what you get paid for. But, yeah, Mr. Fack was probably <laughs> the best one for me. Yeah, so that's another. When I talked about you and me coming up in the teams and hanging out with the same people and being the same, but we were in a platoon together, but we did have the same guys that yeah. raised us both. Right. The same right. guys raised us both. And for sure, Mr. Fack, as you you are calling him, uh, was a huge influence on me. I mean, yeah. a huge influence right. on me. Everything I was or am, it, well, everything I was in the teams, like as far as being professional and like, hey, we're gonna look, that all was taken from Fack. Oh, yeah. All of it was taken yeah. from him, one hundred percent. Me too. And the seriousness that he put towards the job, like the 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 gravity that he put towards the job. And the gravity to put towards the operational stuff that we just talked about, as far as you know, the things that we said makes up your reputation. That's what he cared about above anything else. Right. That's what he cared about, and so for sure, working for him. And that's that's again, that's why when we actually started working together, and I'm just realizing this right now. I mean, I guess I made sense of it before, but when we started working together, that's why we had the same thoughts and things. Right. Everything yeah. was like, of course we're going to do that. It's like when we're bounding back one time somewhere in Iraq and it just we didn't even have to say no. anything to each other. We're no. just like, <laughs> cover and move. <laughs> yeah, cover and move. Go, go, go. <laughs> but one thing real quick about NCO, one of the best I ever had, another sea daddy of mine, and I can say his name because... 
Rest in peace, Tim Farrell. Tim Farrell was a big, big influence on my yeah, life. I mean, me he was too. he was a wicked good operator. I I can't I don't know anybody who's a tougher guy in the teams. Yeah. He's just a hard hitting guy and just he's a really good dude, man. Really good guy. And he was awesome at everything. Everything. You know? Everything. Yep. He yeah. Was good. He was an aw- awesome at everything he did. He'd beat you at everything. Yeah, he would beat guys in the swims, and he wasn't wearing fins, and they were. <laughs> I mean, he was just an incredible athlete. Yeah, know? an incredible athlete. And by the way, he was he would. It's not like a guy that was like, well, you know, I didn't get my workout in today. So no, 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 he, he no, no. He didn't care like about anything. Son of a gun. He he was like, oh, just just get after just it. Just yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Tim Farrell for sure was a great guy. Man. What a frog man he yeah, was. He certainly was. All right. Anything about accuracy of fire in combat versus volume of fire? And I'll tell you the reason I left this one in here, Tony, is uh, a lot of a lot of soldiers and Marines and team guys that I hear from all the time, and they always are listening. And not only that, at this point, and I hate to say it, but in America, our right. our police forces need to start thinking about this kind of stuff because. There's bad stuff happening in America where guys are getting in legit yeah, urban right. warfare. And so talking about the accuracy of fire versus the volume of fire. Well, you know, it's a double, it's a flip of the coin. On depends on the situation, but I can tell you the number of times I fired a rifle, an assault rifle, like an M4, M14 and all that, you know, a scar on full auto is big friggin' goose egg. You know, I, I can't think of one situation or if, if somebody said, okay, Tony, you're going in this room alone and there's eight guys pointing guns at you. Well, okay, Roger that, but, you know, but sometimes, you know, volume of fire, get your heads down. If you're in the street, you got to get that fire. You, you got to try to gain fire superiority. And if you don't have that, you ain't really moving. And uh, so at that point, you know, you're not doing all the things you were taught and <sighs> breathing. You're just getting led down in that direction. To cover your your ass, well, your buddy's ass, so you can move and they can move. Um, but accuracy of fire in combat, you know, in good situations, if you're under fire and you're putting lead down range so you can move, it's real nice to have a supporting element and an elevated position. They're the ones combining these two. And just, yeah, it's a pretty good example. It's pretty nice knowing about four blocks from you. You got Chris Kyle up there. <laughs> talking to you on the radio hold on you see a guy fall out of like the window with a gun you're like thanks brother you know you're pretty confident walking down the street at that point so yeah yeah Uh, the uh the other thing is i mean we always have massive you know firepower with mark 48s and mark 46s to lay down the heavy volumes of fire and that's the same thing uh Roger Hayden was saying in here the other day, who's another, you know, <laughs> person that mentored you and me growing up in the teams. And, uh, but he said that they had four sixties in their 14 man platoon. And like two stoners, three stoners. No, four sixties and five stoners. <laughs> that's, that's what he said. That was what they carried. And, uh, wow. yeah. So, so ain't, you know, what's interesting too? the point, like we talk about point shooting, but, the guys, like all of our guys, are AW gunners. Put sights, put the ACOGs on their on their. Oh yeah, yeah which was yep. partially for PID, so they could tell who they're shooting at, and right? Could see further, but also, man, accuracy. Yeah, it's a four power scope. Yep. You know, and then at night it don't matter because you're using an app peel or a laser, and you're yep. on nods anyway. So. Yep. So, and then one last thing is that you you know again now you're talking to uh, aimed at police officers, but also also. Guys in combat, you don't have unlimited ammunition. No. So you got to think about that, too. Me, me and my brother just had this conversation. And, uh, you know, he's like, well, I, I wish I could, you know, conceal weapon carry, you know. He's got, say I got my revolver and he's got like a uh, 686 stainless mm-hmm. P or mm-hmm. plus, you know, mm-hmm. seven shot, 357. I wonder where he... He wanted a revolver. I told him what to get. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. <laughs> and he one. loves it. But he's like, you know, should I, when I'm concealed carry, should I carry some speed loaders? I'm like, 
Well, chum, is that always convenient? No. Well, you know what? You're not getting in a gunfight. You're not. If you get into somebody shooting, you either shoot them or you put down fire and you run. It's not your fight. Mm-hmm. If someone's jacking your car or whatever and they pull a gun, you shoot them, yes. But, if you know, it's a nightclub shooting or something, you, you, you're blasting your way out of there. And that's it. You're not going to sit there and... You don't have unlimited ammo. Right. And even the teams, we didn't. That was my biggest fear. I would hate to die of lack of shooting back. Yeah. I mean, that would just suck. You know, and we never really did run out. We got low. Mm-hmm. We got low a few times, but never really run out. That's scary. That's why we kind of train on, uh, you know, we did a lot of that where try to set a standard. You can't, you know, if you got to shoot, you shoot. If you run out, then you go to your pistol. If you run out of that, then you go to your grenades or whatever, and then you're just BTF. <laughs> but uh, but we trained, you know. If you're in sustained firefights, yeah. like M4 gunners, you know, after four mags, you got to start slowing it down. Start thinking about round con- conservation. Same thing with the machine gunners. Start slowing your rates of fire down. Initial bursts, initial volleys, and then go down to, like, you know, shorter bursts. More time looking at what you're seeing because... If you're out there hanging with your ass hanging, you know, and you got no rounds, then guess what? It's run time. And nobody wants to run. Mm. That's just that's just terrible. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Uh, next one. To- what is Tony's perspective as an enlisted and older guy serving, quotes, under you as a younger officer, so I, I don't know if this person actually understands that we're about the same age and had been in the teams about the same right. amount of time, and um, we were more brothers than like anything else. And then, uh, what was it like? What were you like to work for compared to other guys you were under? <laughs> well, that first part, that first part there is pretty easy because I remember you and Leif were talking, like. We didn't know who this chuckle guy was. And I, I kind of was walking by the office. It's like a movie where I stopped like halfway through a step. And I backed up and I went, what would you guys say? <laughs> yeah, this new uh, task unit commander. We don't know who he is. What's his name? They're like, uh, Willink. Jocko, Jocko, Jocko or something like that. I'm like, yeah, we're all set. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're all like, you know, because they're the two lieutenants, yeah, you know, Seth, yeah. and, Seth and Leif. And they're like following me into the head. I'm like, relax. <laughs> like, what, about, what about this guy? What about this bike? We're good to go. <laughs> I'm like, we sure we're getting him? They're like, yeah, yeah, it's done. He's he's coming. He'll be here like tomorrow. I'm like, yep, yep, all right. Let me just tell you something. Be squared away tomorrow. And I start walking away. Like, you know this guy? And I was like, you know, is he is he good to go? And I just looked at him and went, I gave him that look like, Please. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> be, be squared away tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, and you better be on your game. Me, I'm going to be hung over tomorrow, so whatever. I've known him forever. But that, and uh, what were you like to work for? What what you were like? Uh, this is not even a question. He was great. He was the best ever. I mean, just, I don't know. We think we think the same. We, we're, we're like-minded, and uh, we like we like to work. We really, really loved our jobs and our men and our people, you know. You know, I hate saying I loved my men. It sounds kind of, you know, whatever. But, I, you know, I did. I really cared about the guys. And that was the best part of being a team guy. And I'm sure Jocko will back me up on that. Absolutely. As your brothers. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. No doubt about that at, at all. Um, all right, next one. Please expound on the early days when you and Tony were new guys in the teams. <laughs> this is like a whole nother podcast. Uh, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know. It was kind of a different time. When we were new guys, like, like my first platoon, we were involved, you know, like the first Gulf War, and I thought it was, wow, that was great, you know, and we really didn't do much, and my platoon didn't. And, you know, it, some of them guys were there for six months, and then the war started, and it was like a month or whatever, and then it was done. It was like, hmm, you know. But other than that, we, we, I think in the later stages of my career, we didn't train as hard, but the deployment, I mean, we still trained hard but 
the deployments were harder, like more work. And back then, if you did a deployment where it was like a training deployment because there was no war going on, we still had to deploy. People don't realize if there's no wars, team guys are still deploying the same up tempo. Yep. And because we need constantly be around the world in case something happens. And, uh, but we did a lot of like hardcore shit. Like we did a lot more reconnaissance work, which meant we didn't have vehicles. So we had LPCs, which are leather personnel carriers, <laughs> meaning boots. <laughs> And we'd hump in like 25 clicks or whatever. And we'd do these ridiculous swims and and these long dives and do all, I mean, really like long, like the harder the better. I mean, you look at a team, to, to put it in perspective, you look at a team guy back then, a lot of them were a lot leaner, you know, and they we did a lot more running and swimming. You look at a, like a team area now, you go to the gym, and it looks like WW or you know, MMA wrestlers. You know, I mean, they do. Everybody's like, like stronger, and not because you got to carry more shit. We do do a lot more direct action stuff, but also <laughs> we did a lot of drinking and partying. <laughs> well, in San Diego, we did. I know that. Yeah, and uh, we hung a lot together. Nobody was married. You know, I don't. We had like sixteen guys in my platoon, and yep. one was married. Yep. And he was the LPO. Yeah, like no one was married. No, we all hung out together all the time. And we all like lived in Imperial Beach or like Chula Vista. <laughs> now people live like 40 miles away and like everyone's married and owns a house. Nobody owned a house. We didn't have any money. <laughs> I mean, Cruise boxes. Yeah we, yeah, we had a house, like five guys in an apartment with like one, one couch. And it was just a disaster. <laughs> you fun. know the... the- <laughs> the guy that you were talking about earlier that I lived in uh, Coronado with, mm-hmm. and uh, for quite some time, we had we in our house we had, we only had one fork. <laughs> so it'd be like it'd be like, hey man, are you, are you almost done with the fork? Because I want to I want to eat my dinner now. <laughs> Couldn't go to Vons and buy another fork. I could totally just, see that happening yeah. with you two gorillas. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was funny. So that, when I, I when I remember one of the big things I remember about checking into Team One was was just not even looking people in the eyes because it was no. this this reputation and and of just you're just gonna get beat down. Yeah and we, you, we got hazed a lot too. Oh yeah we got beat up, we got hazed and uh, a lot. <laughs> you didn't you know you didn't come in there thinking that the world owed you anything at all. Yeah, no. The only thing they owed you was an ass beating. Right. And you know, uh we had some big monster guys at the team too. I remember I checked in and there was this one guy who you know a Probably the biggest guy at Team One. <laughs> I'm not going to say his name again, just because I I don't want to. Jay. Yeah. Begins with a J. Um. Um. <laughs> I'm checking it. You know, I'm, I'm at the team and I'm doing over there doing some push-ups or something, and I see this guy come out of the gym. He's literally how tall is he? Six six. Yeah, about that. Six six. 300 pounds. <laughs> oh, yeah, a monster. monster. He's completely covered in tattoos, <laughs> and he's walking. It's about a. 40 meter walk from the back of the team one building to the to the area where we keep the outboard motors and stuff and he's walking he's lumbering right he's lumbering along and about 20 meters into this hike he stops and he's got a gallon of milk in his hand and he just he stops like stops and uncorks the milk and just sits there and drinks half a gallon of milk slowly puts it back down puts the lid back on and then lumbers the rest of the way over I'm like, good lord! I hope that guy doesn't eat me, <laughs> like kill me and eat me. And so that was that was definitely the team one uh, thing. When I got to team one, I w- everyone was just big bunch of tough, mean bastards, uh, yeah. <laughs> and they were getting ready to kick your ass at any time, On a daily just, basis. Yeah, and 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 I, I, you know, I think you know nowadays there's a war going on, you know, right. and so the guys have a different kind of test ahead of them, and that's yeah. cool. You know, that's a different kind of test and it's a harder test and it's it is that's that's what we that's what guys join the teams for. So the young team guys that are coming in, freaking badass. Awesome. Absolutely. And I, I tell you what, man, people say whatever about what they want to say about the way millennials are and all this stuff. Man, I've been to some hanging out with some team guys, especially after some memorials and stuff. These young frogmen, they're badass. Oh, yeah. Badass guys Absolutely. that are ready to die or kill without question. And uh, so respect and 
I'm so glad to see where the te- the teams maintains that always. Absolutely. All right. If Tony had to write for the history books three top stories of Chinese example of BTF getting after it, what would they be? Just give me one. <laughs> give me one. Oh my god, everything everything there's is There's so many good examples. There's so there. many good ones. Um It's hard to say just one guy, you know, but uh <laughs> I don't know. I'm one time when me and uh, Dauber did that like thousand yard center peel. <laughs> that was pretty hard to contain. That it didn't bother me. That was hard, man. I mean, that was that was pretty hard. Like, I mean, this is a tactic with two guys. There's two of us bringing up the rear. This this extraction, you know. Actually, yeah, it wasn't extraction because it was by foot. Otherwise, it would have been an exfiltration. But we kind of took up the rear. We started, like, covering, moving. And them guys were just on a dead run. But we had to stop, go, stop, mm-hmm. go, for about, like, a mile or whatever. <laughs> it was just terrible. <laughs> I mean, I was sweating like a teamster, man. I mean, I was just... And, of course, it was, like, 8 o'clock in the morning. Ugh. And it's, like, 110 degrees out. That was That was pretty good. That was a pretty good one. But I remember getting back to the old days with that. I mean, we didn't say BTF back then. But we used to do some horrendous humps. You know, humping to the civilian world means, like, marching. Not marching, but patrolling. Mm-hmm. And it'd be like, Boots. you look at the map, and we, don't, we, we didn't patrol in the day. So it'd be like, all right, it gets dark at, like, 1900. We're going to move out about 1930. And it gets, then we're going to stop at about 05. Yep. And we got to cover, I don't know, 40 clicks. Yeah. All right, let's go. And your 100 pound rucksack, you're like, really? Okay, let's go. And you think, oh, I couldn't have been a plumber or something. Oh, no, I'd be a team guy. <laughs> I couldn't have been like, went to college. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, you know, and you were, you were kind of talking about this earlier, but uh, I remember times where you guys be out in the field for two or three days and meanwhile while you're in the field we're spinning up another operation course, finding yeah. out another target for a direct action mission and you guys would get back and you'd be like hey man we got a target for you you're rolling out in two hours so and you know you just go to your guys and be like all right guys change your gear you're yep, heading out let's and go. you're loading vehicles in an hour and 30 minutes and you see guys just turn and burn yep yeah nobody said oh really <laughs> say, no just do it you know and yeah, my whole that that platoon that I had on that deployment. I mean, them guys BTF. I mean, especially like the sisters' kids. Those guys were, you know, we had the new guys, we had the older guys, and then we had the middle guys. You know, and you know, you know, Spaz and uh, yeah. Squirrel and Chucky. Those guys and Rex. Those guys were badass, man. For sure. For sure. I mean, they just they didn't. They were the meat kind of of the platoon and they were the ones that like had to do like most of the work mm-hmm. you know the new guys helped them and the other th- older guys were more of leadership positions yeah and they still work too but these guys worked and they just like got yeah, rudge that and just got after it good dudes and I, day after day i after guarantee day after day after day i guarantee all them guys i mean i couldn't keep up with everyone after i retired i guarantee all of them guys are doing well in their careers because they're fantastic. I I do see them, and they are all kicking ass. Roger that. That's good for sure. How does Tony decide what strategies, tactics to use on a mission against an enemy? Curious about your thought process. Hmm. Well, first of all. You got to figure out which, what we're talking about. My experience in the savages that we slayed and killed and shot. Uh, first of all, it's better to shoot someone in the back. So, you know, a lin- you know, an ambush where you can catch him walking away from you is always the best. But front, you just BTF and figure it out. Uh we're talking about Sung Su there, mm-hmm. you know, the art of war. And, you know, 
I thought, you know, he says, if you know yourself and your enemy, you don't not, not don't need to fear a thousand battles or whatever. Well, I know myself pretty damn good, and I know my group pretty damn good. And I didn't have time to read all that stuff and figure it out, so I figured I'd just hate the enemy. I'll just hate him, and that hate will fuel my passion to make the operation as best I can and work it the best I can and learn from the mistakes that didn't that didn't work out. But that's that kinda when you when you got that, it kinda pyramids down and everything kinda works itself out. You know? And you can't be afraid to try something different. Because and you can't be afraid to bounce it off people. That's what's great about Jocko. I would I would bounce something off of him, you know, and he'd be like, Yep, that's good. Or he'd go. Now now wait a minute, because he wouldn't let it go. You know, he'd be like can they walk me through this again? <laughs> Roger, we're going to do that, that, that. And uh, I would also really, when I'd let other people run operations or I would work with other groups, I would I would just kind of wait for when they glanced over something. And I'd go, well, uh, wait a minute. Okay, go, now what are we going to do here? Well, you know, we're just going to do this. I, I don't know. I don't know what that means. Please explain it to me. Well, and they hadn't really thought about it. Yep. And that's the little glitch in the mission plan that's going to get you killed. Mm-hmm. But you can't, you know, you can't take a lot of time to plan an op sometimes. Sometimes it's like, all right, you know what? An assault. Here we're going to go. We're, we're going to go in strong like cowboys or we're going to go on the prowl. We're going to go in surreptitious entry, be real stealthy. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes it calls for a straight up punch them up, you know, just mix it up and BTF, you know, and that's easy to do because you don't get a plan much. Okay, let's just go over there and kill everybody. Show us where they go and we'll yep. go. Yep. So I don't know if that answers that question, but kinda, yeah, I think. And from my perspective, uh, I mean, and you just kind of made it sound like big, no big deal, but Tony was always pouring over the imagery, looking at the maps, trying to figure out which angle, trying to figure out the best spot, trying to, that's what he was doing all the time. Just trying to analyze as much as he could and make the best plan. And and I think also, man, the the experience level, you know? Because like right, I said, right. even even pre-war, pre-9-11, how many freaking ops did you and I do training ops where we did all this stuff? 2,000? Yeah, it's just like over and over. Wow. And so by the time you get there, it's really, even though these weren't combat operations, you get you. We learned a lot from them, and there was little adjustments we had to make for sure. But for the most part, what you learned how to do, what you learned how to do, is you learned how to take a group of guys and get them to do something, right? And when you learn how to do that, okay, that that's then you okay. You want us to do this? Cool. I know how to take a group of guys and get them to do something. It doesn't matter what that thing is. I can get a group of guys to do something, and that's what's beneficial. Yep. That's what all that years of experience helps you out with. It doesn't right. necessarily help you. I mean, it didn't help us with with doing the specific mission that night. No, no, of course not. Because you can't you can't cover everything. No, no. I mean, at that point, I had three years as an instructor in land warfare, and it was my eight ninth deployment. So I you know, I'd been, you know, eight platoons or whatever. And, and I, there's not much more I was gonna, you know, learn from another six months of training i mean it's pretty much i mean there's no real thing i was going wow i've never done this before you know like yeah okay yeah yeah all right what was the most difficult thing you ever did as a seal when was the most fearful moment in your life well i get asked this a lot and uh tell you the truth it's got nothing to do with you know the bombs and the wars and the killing and stuff it's like I never, ever batted an eye skydiving or static lining, jumping into the water, jumping at night. Never bothered me one bit. You know, not at all. Never even was scared at all. But I don't like getting on the roof. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I hate being a 40-foot ladder or in a man lift. You know, I work for a landscaping company. And sometimes we're up in the man lift. It's like, man, this kind of sucks. <laughs> and I'll admit it. I'm a little bit afraid of heights at that level. And... Repelling off a building one morning in Hong Kong, you know, like a 60 story building, and we're repelling off and then going through a window, and you got a training, you got to shoot these targets and stuff. And I mean, it's pretty cool, but 
I didn't like it at all. <laughs> and this morning it was windy and the building's actually moving. And I look down, I'm going on a rappel. You know, I'm edging over the side. I'm on the top of this building. And the people look like raisins, you know, down there. <laughs> and I mean, that's needless to say, I mean, I, I got to go to the bathroom and I'm hungover. And I was like, oh my God. But I'd rather die than be called a pussy. I'm, I'm going to do it. <laughs> no, but I'd rather die than be a puss. So that was pretty much the, I'll never forget that day either. It was terrible. The most fearful moment. Oh, the most difficult thing you ever did as a SEAL? Retire. Without a doubt, 100%. Retire. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I hear you. All right. Tony's favorite piece of kit. And over Tony's career, what's what piece of gear has advanced the most? Not including... Night vision, which obviously improved up to a bunch. Well, I'll get to my favorite piece of gear kit, but uh, evolution of gear, it's got to be, you know, there's a couple of things. Like I say, boots. The mm-hmm. boot thing is phenomenal. We got such good gear and boots now. Also, you got to look at navigation. You know, I, I remember the first GPSs, we, we used to call them giant pieces of shit because <laughs> they were like the size of an yeah. ammo crate. Yeah, they were yeah. huge. They were huge, and they, and they looked like a... A telephone from the Korean War, you know, and uh, but nowadays they're just badass, yep. you know. And it would global positioning systems, I mean, and also communications. Yep. I mean, your satellite communication is absolutely fantastic. And everybody who was in the military out there, when we had all the old kicks and Diana pads, and if you remember that oh, yeah. HF high frequency, and we did a lot of HF and stringing up antennas. Oh out my in the god, woods. it was terrible. Literally, yeah, literally stringing up you know eighty yeah. foot antennas so you could make a communication shot to some other distant station. <laughs> I, I, Morris code, literally using Morris code. Oh yeah, absolutely. Good times. But my favorite piece of kit, I would have to say, is anything that you get in and drive. Because <laughs> back in the day, we didn't we didn't use any mobility really. Yeah. Everything was on foot, and it's yeah. like holy shit. That and the uh, the three hundred Win Mag sniper rifle suppressed with a twenty two power Night Force scope on it <laughs> is a wicked good piece of kit. Let me tell you what. I mean, I can read your T shirt at a click. <laughs> That's pretty good. Legit, legit. All right. Tony, what is the number one quality that allows a leader to lead men into uncomfortable conditions and succeed? What's uncomfortable? Well, I guess just bad scenarios, tough yeah. situations. Well, I think keep it in your mind, mission men. Mission men. Look, guys, you're not paid to sit here. and Here's what we got to do. Let's go do it. Yes. Uh it sucks sometimes. It's bad. But mission men, if you keep thinking that, that's what we're paid to do. The bottom line is you follow the orders of the guy above you. And we're team guys, so that line bleeds a lot. It has a lot of waves in it, you know, because he'll be like, hey, Tony, what do you think we ought to do? Well, I don't know, Jocko. Let's do this. All right. It sounds good. But at any given time, if he goes, hey, Tony, this is what we're doing. Roger that. Mm-hmm. And that's it. Even if it means dying because... If you lead by example and you're humble and you're good to your guys and you know your guys and you let them know you, but you don't wipe their ass and you don't take any shit from them and they know you, they'll follow you. You know, if you're humble and you make mistakes, admit it and move on. And I think that's, uh, I know a few of my guys, probably most of them would follow me wherever we went, you know, and, uh, I guess that's just because I never changed. They always knew what they are going to get from me. Mm. That's about it. Steady. Yep. Yeah, the other uh, the other big thing is making sure people understand why they're doing what they're doing. Because like Tony just said, man, we, we're going to have discussions about stuff and say, hey, this is why. This is why. Well, well, this is why I think we should do it this way. You know, it's not just like, hey, right. go and do. Now, there are situations, of course, where someone goes, hey. Go and execute this now. Hey, go hit that building. Hey, take guys over there. There's times in combat where you got to make those decisions and you got to make things happen. And 
that's when you talk. That's when it, that's when the important things that you just talked about having a just trust. Right. Like I, I just had trust in my guys. They trusted me that if I was telling them to do something, it was the right thing to do. And by the way, if I told Tony go take that building over there, and he looked at me and said negative, not now. I knew he was saying that to me for a reason. Yeah, because there's something wired reason. in front of it. Or yeah, something. there was a reason why he was telling me that. And we're not going to have that discussion. Probably don't have time to do it right right now. I'd say, okay, then we got to get out of here. And he'd say, okay. Roger. Roger. And then we'd go. <laughs> so, man, having that trust, building up that trust through, you know, the humility, the relationship, all that stuff is is how you end up with a tight unit. And that's how you, that really, that's how you lead. Tony, did you have the same attitude towards death as Jocko? Were you prepared to die? Uh, was I prepared to die? Yes, in a second. That's <laughs> get that over with right away. Uh, I really didn't have an attitude of death except for, you know, making other people die, the bad guys. Then I didn't care about them. I didn't. I guess I dehumanized them in my mind, so it wouldn't bother me because it, you know, because they're just they're just they're not people. They're a target. And you just whack them and that's it. And, uh, I was, I was definitely prepared to die. As a matter of fact, you know, I thought that would be like the end of my career, like kind of, but, um, I thought it would be the end of your career too. <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> um, there was a couple guys in our task unit. I was not scared to die. There all. was a couple guys in our task unit that I, I, did not think we're going to make it because they were just like, I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to be giving a speech at his funeral because he's a fired up young kid that does not care about. Yeah. Like just not the other way for those of you out there. Like, oh, he like didn't do his job. He was like, Argh! yeah, no, <laughs> like, like just guys that were so, <laughs> so fired up that, uh, yeah. And like even our guys that did get killed, there wasn't one of them where I thought, oh, he's, he wasn't ready for that. Right. Yeah, he was Did he want it? Of course, those guys didn't want it. I would love to have him here. They would love to be here. But at the moment of truth, they they did what I what I would think they would, would have done. Right, right. None of them did I say, oh, it's a shame or or anything like that. Because those guys had those attitudes of they were there, they were, they they loved their job, they loved doing their job, they believed in what they were doing, and that that's the way it was. Absolutely. All right. Tony's view on training, mentoring, integrating new guys into the platoon. Yeah, I mean, I've been on the LPO side of that. I've been on the not new guy side of that. I've been on the new guy side of that. I've been on the chief side of it. And uh, I usually told the guys, you know, you're on time. Be motivated because it's fun. For those of you that think, like, the SEAL teams to me is a thousand times more than I thought it would be. It's a fucking blast. <laughs> it's the best thing ever. It's the best men's club in the world. And, uh, but, like you said, you're trying to build these guys, have these guys build their own reputation. You know, confidence. Nobody has any confidence in the first day at the team. Nobody. Um, try to instill confidence in them. And uh, I used to tell them, you know, should be seen, not heard. Carry a pen and paper. Be on time. And shut the fuck up. <laughs> Nobody cares about any of your stories or where you're from or none of that crap. You know, St. Stripes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, eventually that'll come out in a year. <laughs> you know, so just just ask questions if you need to. Be on time. Listen. Do your job. Yeah. And uh, show the guys the right way to do things. And if it's not the right way, you know. Tell them how to know the difference. Show them how to know. Do what they did for me. You know, and they look, and you look in their eyes, and they're just like, Roger, but no, you don't get it. You have no, show me what I just said. <laughs> okay, just say you don't understand, you know. But that's about it. Just try to be, uh, 
you know, fair with them and direct. That's about it. Lead by example. One thing I want to say there is about, uh, you know, talk about being steady. We had a situation one time when I was I was a platoon chief and we were working hard, wicked hard, like going up tempo was through the roof. The battle rhythm was shot to hell because it was just go, 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 go. And the guys were getting tired and stuff. And, and we had a meeting about it and I didn't say anything. And they're like, yeah, if we can just slow down a little bit, you know, and I was like, OK, I mean, legitimate bitch. You know, because sometimes you go, go, go like that. Things get unsafe and you start making mistakes. But we hadn't really made any mistakes at that point. And I said, put it in perspective at this time, like Daba, some of them guys were like 22, 23 years old. I was like 38. (laughs) And I go, I use the analogy, like we used to say, you're only as fast as the slowest guy in your patrol. Maybe the guy that's got more weight, carrying more equipment. So he sets the pace. And I go, and they go, do you agree with that? And everyone's like, yeah, yeah. I go, well, we'll take a break when the oldest guy here gets tired. And that's me. And I'm not tired. <laughs> Enough said. Okay, Roger that. Go to work. <laughs> They're just like, eh, right, Roger. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully some of the new guys learn something on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no doubt about that. It's uh, leading from the front, you know. If yep. the, <laughs> no doubt about it. All right. How does one put the high of war behind him? And is he and and are you always searching for it still in other things? Uh have I transitioned to civilian life? Kind of ish a little. <laughs> I just don't like it. It's, I mean, it's it's terrible. Like, there's no action. I mean, there's no, you know, going and it, uh, who didn't like going to work on a Monday morning? Yeah, it was the best. I mean, and you know, and that, and, and by the way, you went to work on Sunday. You went to work on, on Saturday. Saturday. Yeah, just every every oh oh like some of the guys of the team. Oh yeah, it's a weekend. No, we'll be at the team. We're right. gonna be working out. Then we're yeah. working on our gear. Then we're gonna go have some beer. Then we're gonna go out. Then we're gonna wake up the next morning and do the same thing on Sunday. And then we're gonna right. come in on Monday. That's what it is. Yeah, because who cares about it? what else are you gonna do? Yeah, what else are you gonna do? Like oh, you go, go with your for friends. A hike. Go with your friends. All my friends are in the team. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So uh, so it gives you nothing. <laughs> yeah. So oh, that's it. Go that's back to whatever. Failed relationship I had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, that can definitely be a little tricky. Am I searching for another things? Probably, you know. Uh, I don't know. I don't. That's such a hard question to put in perspective. I mean, I live in New Hampshire now, and I work forty hours a week, and I do all right. But I don't. There's no. You know, the magic in my life is, like, gone. I mean, that was that was the magic, the glue that held me together as the teams, you know. And, you know, I got some good families back there, you know, that, that helped me out, like, friends of mine, friends of my family, and, like, the Murphys, you know, the Daniels, the Downses. I mean, there's just, it's a, if, you know, if I don't get to people back home's name, I'm sorry, but... uh you know, I got really good friends that, that try to help me, kind of, but they just have no idea, like, you know. There's one old team guy from back there that's like from the 70s, you know, and I talk to him, and it's like, Roger. <laughs> you know, then there's a sergeant major, retired 30 years back there. But it's a small town, and it's like, I drink a lot, and, you know, I work a lot, too, so I'm kind of functioning that way, but there's no, I don't know. I, don't know, I guess I'm still looking for something, but it's just the high war is just like, I don't know, it's, I think you could say it's the fucking best. <laughs> it's like the best thing ever, you know, and once you get done with a big firefight, you're like, <laughs> yeah, you want to go back and like, can we do that again and again and again? It was so much fun. I mean, even, I mean, it sucks, it's hard, but it's, it's, it's great. I mean, we just, cause if you think about, like, they say heroes, right? To me, the real heroes are them guys standing a post out there with minimal training that don't want to be there and still do their job. And fine American soldiers, sailors, Marines, you know, airmen, whatever. For us, that's our profession. Like, 
You know, that's like, we didn't even want to go home. It's like our blood and our guts, it's in our DNA. That's where we want to be. So, I mean, how do you, you don't just, you do all that stuff for all those years. There's going to be side effects. <laughs> you know, there's going to be. I don't care. I'm, you know, I'm not going to go, I don't go see a counselor or nothing because I think I'm strong enough that, you know, I can handle it. But it's not easy. You know, you, you know it's like when people, when people always come up and they say, you know, thank you for serving. They, they always say that. And, I, you know, I always say, hey, it was an honor to oh, serve. Of course, of course. But what I really want to say, and sometimes if it's a deeper conversation, I'm like, don't thank me. I feel guilty <laughs> no, because it do was enough. so fun. <laughs> and, and, like, you guys paid me to do this. Like, what did right. you do when you were a little right. kid? I ran around the woods and played military stuff and ra- put camouflage, put co- old black cork on my face and w- played with guns and yep. beat shot BB guns. And that's what I did all the time as a kid. And then I, I grew up. And I turned 18, and then they started paying me money to do the same thing. I know. And then they said, oh, there's a bunch of bad guys. You go kill them. Oh, okay. Yeah. They will give you more money. And then, yeah, so so people say thank you, and it, it sort of de- it definitely makes you feel like, damn, man, I got so lucky. The day I enlisted in the military, I got so lucky because it was like, you know, it was like a the, the square peg found the square hole, basically. Right, right. And that's what a lot of team guys are like. And that's why when all of a sudden the square, they go, okay, you can't use that that square hole anymore. They pull you out and there's a triangle there. Yeah. And you're just like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Out. Yeah, it doesn't work. Yeah, it's so true. And they, the service to me, I went in when I was eight. I enlisted when I was 17. Went in when I was 18. Got out when I was, what, 45, 44, whatever. And it never lied to me. They always paid me, and they'll pay me for the rest of my life. And everything they said was true. Do this. They go, oh, the military's a bunch of bullshit. Well, yeah, there's little things, but overall, you know, I didn't have to, like, figure out figure out like a woman. And, <laughs> you know, I was all wishy-washy about shit and stuff. And, you know, and well, that's just part of whatever, being a man and stuff. But they never lied to me. It was always just really really good and yeah. civilian life's not like that i mean i deal with people and for the most part everybody out there is a good person i believe but i get mad because of the misuse of the military now mm. i mean it's so misuse it's crazy grab two hundred thousand badass army soldiers and marines go over to where isis is and smoke these sons of bitches what are we waiting for I, I don't get it. Cause, but on the flip coin, people are like, we got to pay the deficit because we don't want our children to pay it. Yeah, but do you want them to fight the war? Let's, we got the muscle right now. I don't know what we're waiting for. This is a crock of shit. Hopefully that'll change. Yeah, uh, hopefully it will change. <laughs> uh, you know what? Do one more question here. How do you keep your head in the game when one of your squad is killed? Yeah, you know, well, I think for me, you have to treat it like mission men in that order. And to me, there's no use, you know, the milk is on the floor. There's no use crying over it. You know, EOD doesn't, you know, defuse a bomb that already went off. Okay. What you got to do is try not to lose any more of your men. Okay. Now you just got to do the mission with the dead guy. And I know that sounds maybe cruel or something, but there ain't no time to sit there and mourn or do any of that. You have to complete your op. You have to do your mission. Right? Um, there's plenty of time to mourn. There's plenty of time to figure out what went wrong or d- what didn't go wrong or whatever happened when you're back and the op's done. And that's why we train like that. When we train and we're going through a building... And they put a guy down. You just step over him and clear the house because you don't want to get, you know, more than one killed. You just have to do what you've been trained to do. And in the leadership position, it's very hard not to, you know, you can train all your life, but when something happens like that, it's very hard not to just go, oh, my God, I got somebody killed. You know, what happened? What happened? Because I take it very personally because it was one of my guys, and I racked my brain for a long time. And then uh, I figured out that, well, you know, I just got to do my job and be a leader, you know, and I can't let the rest of the guys down. 
And I can't let myself down or my team or my country. So I got to do what I got to do to get out of there. Well, not get out of there, but complete the op. Right. And then figure it out. Then take care of him as best we can and have a lot of respect. And that's about the best way I can answer that, bro. Yeah, you know, I, I remember uh, after Mark got killed, and he was a, obviously he was the first seal killed in Iraq. He's the first guy that ever worked for me that got killed. And I remember a couple of days went by. We actually did the memorial ceremony. Um, and like a couple of days went by, and I was kind of trying to figure out what to say to the platoons, specifically what to say to your platoon. Right. And I was sort of. Uh, and I realized what I was doing, right? What I was doing was th- the only thing I knew how to do, which is work. work. Yep. And finally, I remember I was, I wrote, that's what I, that's what I wrote down. I'm like, look, Mark I came into your platoon and, and I said, hey, Mark is the best motherfucker ever. Yeah, he was. <laughs> and my fucking soul is crushed right now. And I actually remember, as I was talking, I started getting emotional. And I I stopped, and I was getting a little choked up. And I stopped talking, and I was just trying to get it together. And you were sitting there, and you're like, hey, man, it's okay. And I was like, check. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to work. Yep. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to work. We're going to work. You know, when that happened, I was thinking about that. I I never, ever once shed one tear. And I started getting, like, concerned. Like, do I have anything, my feelings at all? And then we came back from that deployment. I remember maybe, I don't know, six months later or something. It may not sound like, it may shock you, but I, I used to like cats. I used to like cats, you know? You always seem like a cat guy. <laughs> I like dogs too, you know? Like just me and my girlfriend at the time had cats. And my cat died. And I bawled like a little baby for like three hours. And I, just, I think it was just a point in me waiting for it to come out. You know, and I'd be like, Okay, because you're a team guy around that stuff all the time. Mm. People getting maimed, shot, killed, and blown up, and you know, and then it kind of festers. And then I, I think you know, it's kind of deep and stuff, but whatever. I'm not really that deep of a person, <laughs> <laughs> and it just came out, and I was like, you know, that's kind of cool. Yeah. So maybe I was just, you know, I I took the like be hard thing a little too 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 much probably, mm. but. <laughs> well I think that's about all we've got for tonight and uh thanks everybody for asking those questions Tony you got any got anything else you want to say any closing comments nah just shout out to all my my chums and uh all my brothers and the teams and you know all the people that know me my family and everybody and uh thanks for being so nice to me and the teams thanks for being so nice to me and let me do all those wicked cool things you know and uh jocko thanks for having me it's so good to see you my brother Always. echo pleasure i mean just just phenomenal you know you don't know how many people watch your show <laughs> watch this well what fires me up the most is uh obviously the military guys and the team guys and uh team guys that are you know our bros that are like, hey man, that was great. Oh yeah, yeah I learned, yeah. and I, that just gets me. Uh, that's why I'm doing this, man. Yeah, that's why I'm doing this. Yeah. And yeah, that's that's what means the most to me. And and having you on here, obviously, is uh, is phenomenal. So, um, everybody that is out here that's listening to this, thanks for listening to the podcast. Thanks for supporting it. If you do want to support the podcast a little bit. <laughs> Echo Charles, <laughs> tell them quickly how to do it. Actually, it's like actually, I do have one uh, one more question. Go ahead. You um, you know how? Okay, you're like a hard guy. I know this, put real simply, and this might be kind of an ambiguous question, but 
like that example you say it was real hot and you're not even drinking water you're drinking coffee in copenhagen yeah kind of example like why is that you know how because it, it's a spectrum right like a lot of people like some people they can be big they can run you know 10 miles no problem all this stuff mm. but they get in certain kind of discomfort physically or whatever yeah. they're done or you get these big guys or whatever they'd miss one meal they're done right you know? right right they're thoroughbreds yeah so you're like the uh, are we were you like was i was part of that crew in the teams who like fist fought and drank a lot and right, so right. that kind of trained us like being hung over and stuff like <laughs> I mean, we would be like hung over and go to work, and you work out for three hours. Yeah. So these guys would, I knew guys who were like, they could never do that. Right. So we were kind of like bottom feeders. So when the shit got bad, we're like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. The, I'll, I'll, I'll make it. But I'm not there. like that anymore. Like, I work, <laughs> I need to drink water because I'm not used to it anymore. Yeah. You know? I, I would, there was some kind of a genetic component. Like, right? Like, like I, I freely admit, like, I don't sleep a lot, right? And I understand that it's not just because, like, I'm just tough. It's because there's some genetic component in there that doesn't require a lot of sleep. And, yeah, me and, either. And, you know, I have one of my, I've t- t- told this before, like one of my daughters, uh, I'll go to bed at like 11.30, she'll be awake, and then I'll wake up at 4.30 in the morning and she'll be awake. Like she's genetically, she doesn't need a lot of sleep. So I know I'm kind of like that too. Mm-hmm. And there's some, just FYI for Tony, there's something genetic about the water intake because, I mean, I did patrols and stuff with you and- you know, I, I mean, I'm fairly hard, but I need water. You know, I would need to carry more water than you. And, you know, never, never would I be like a, a, a bitch about it. Like, but no, you know, I, 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 is- I would need like twice as much water as Tony would need. And I don't weigh twice as much. I mean, I'm whatever. I'm maybe 40, 40 pounds heavy or something like that. But so there's some genetic component that makes you need less water and makes me need a decent amount of water. Yeah. So. Again. Also, I spent a lot of time at Nylon. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, You're acclimated yeah. you know, to it. Yeah. I'm not like that now. Like, right. I need a lot of water. But yeah. even even overall, above and beyond just the water situation where, and you're like this too a lot. We're kind of talking about this where, do you think that, you know, like if you just sit around indoors and after a while you're like, bro, I got to get out. Oh, yeah. A lot of people, they're not like that. They're, they're the opposite. There's like, dang, there's a lot going on outside. I better stay indoors. <laughs> yeah. Even yeah. even big, tough, strong guys, a lot of people are right. like that. Is it, and does it, does this kind of fall in line with why you took to the team so, oh, that's so readily? Absolutely. You know? Echo. Because you're like doubt. that too. Without yeah. a doubt. And I'll tell you, again, going back to give credit where credit's due, man, the people that, we were raised by the same people in the teams. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And those guys... They didn't complain about anything. They showed no weakness ever. Ever. They, ever. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, you're tired? They would ne- you'd never hear a guy say he was tired ever. No, ever. No, no, no. Uh, you know, <laughs> hurt doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, uh, broken something? No. Just be quiet. Put tape yeah. on it. Yeah. Shut it was, up. Yeah. And yeah. that's and so when you're brought up that way, and I mean, it was blatantly obvious when you got the team. So, oh, yeah. Like, if you, you just, no, there was no, no, just don't complain about anything. Yeah. Just be, just suck it up. Oh, this yeah. sucks? Yeah. Don't even admit that it sucks. Don't ever do that. Yeah. And that's, be quiet. That's, that's probably the best way to explain it. <laughs> yeah. That and, like, I didn't have anything else but that. Like I said, I wasn't the best shooter. I wasn't the, the biggest guy. But yeah. I had that. I always yeah. had that. <laughs> I remember one time we were training. And you know how, like, after a round is done, you, like a lot of people, and I was one of those people, you just... Yeah, you just flop on your back and lay down and get your rest. Yeah, weak. One th- yeah, bro. One time, <laughs> long time ago. Took your like, eyes off your enemy. <laughs> that was more or less the attitude. He was like, you look a little tired there. Almost like it was when you first kind of started coaching me up a lot. Yeah. And you were like, you look a little tired there. But it wasn't a joke. It yeah. was kind of like as if you really wanted to say, bro, don't do that don't right do there. That like shit. stand up, walk. Don't, yeah. You're like showing weakness. Like, I don't like how you do that. That no. was really the tone. That was. Terrible. So that makes a lot of sense right there. But that being said, I think it goes, I feel like it goes a little bit above and beyond just having a skill or, or being really good at being able to tolerate pain. I, I feel like just like how you were saying, I think, you know, a few weeks ago, you were like, there is there is I a word for it. I want some a little bit of pain to show I'm alive, kind of thing. Right, absolutely. But like in our case, I think it can be categorized as that we are uh, we're, we're lunatics. Yeah, like massive. <laughs> because who wants who? 
Yeah. No, no. Let's just be a frogman for 20 <laughs> years. I mean, let's just put so hard on your body. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we are lucky. Yeah, Man. lucky. But a guy like lucky. Tim Farrell, who you talked about earlier, I mean, all the guys that we talked about, Mr. Fack, I mean, <laughs> you, you, he, he, how old? he When he, we were coming up on the teams, he was 40 six 47 years old yeah, he was old. all broken yeah. He, yeah you know broken knees broken ankles guess what out there on a six and a half mile run oh yeah, yeah. Uh, every single time and what were the complaints none not one <laughs> none ever ever just just crush everyone and just be mm-hmm. actually like like mr fact he wouldn't he wouldn't crush people on the run but you'd see him hobbling yeah across the finish line and you'd be like that had to hurt so bad yeah. but he just yeah. well, whatever yeah Put a little tape on it. Well, I, I fell out of a helicopter and broke my heel bone on Halloween day. Yeah. And I deployed and, well, actually, I went over it before I deployed. So I deployed in March. Dang. Yeah, I got I got hammered and I cut my cast off with these bolt cutters. And that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> and uh, I remember the master chief of the command, he'd, he'd be, he's like, he wanted to make sure I was good to go to go overseas. So mm. I'd be walking down the hallway. And I'd see him. I'd walk perfect. Yeah, 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 no limit. And it hurt so bad. I, <laughs> he goes, how you doing? I'd stand there and shoot, shoot the shit with him for a minute. Good, good, Roger. All right. Hey, I got to go. Go in the bathroom. He'd go in the head and be like, oh, <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> I mean, I was still hobbling when we deployed. Yeah. But it just, it just kind of went away. <laughs> There's no way I was missing that. No, no way. way. No. <laughs> like, I think most of us are like that. Maybe to begin with, but maybe taught like out of it. Because, you know, I mean, even an everyday person, if they, they do something kind of hard or work out or even, you know, something like people will recreation will be like, oh, I think I want to run a marathon or something like that. So when they do something hard or kind of painful, some kind of adversity and it's done, you feel good. I think that's a natural oh, thing. Absolutely. right? absolutely. Like people like, like, look at my cool scar, you know, that kind of thing. But it kind of feels like and I'm kind of listening and stuff from as an outsider a little bit here. It kind of seems like those shackles of kind of being trained out of that just didn't happen for you guys and, and guys like you, you know? Oh, yeah. Maybe we got trained in the other way. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think you yeah. you guys just held on to it, you know? Oh, absolutely. Like it just. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's no doubt. And there's a bunch of bunch of badass frogmen yeah. that are in the teams. Yeah, that's all. That's and all and my you know, are. you you know, you can go talk to the Marines, Army soldiers, tough bastards. Bro, oh yeah, cake nuts. Okay, so when when he's living here, we're rolling jujitsu. What's that thing that cross? It's like this syndrome when you just work out. Oh without, yeah, it's called. It's like uh, beyond rab, over- rab, rabdo rhabdomyolysis. Yeah, so he gets that by the way, and he um, it's just from his rolling. his best friend growing up. Two of them, two two of his best friends growing up. Our team guys. I'll tell you who they are later. Oh, nice. So yeah. he's we're rolling jujitsu and he's like going every day, oh, just all day. He's like, I'm just doing jujitsu and he's not. He's kind of quiet, you know. And he's like, oh, we're all done. We've been done. Hard day. Then like, see, you know, the guys who showed up later, whatever. They, yeah. They're still kind of. They're like, hey, you want to roll? Okay, that's like this. Okay, like that. So he never says no. <laughs> the next week, <laughs> like I guess already. he had to go to the doctor or whatever. The next week, he's like, "Yeah, you have that me- rhabdo. Like, have yeah. you been doing a lot of physical output? You know, this is." He's like, "Yeah, be careful I've just with been that. freaking." I know, but that's <laughs> exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> but but normally that stops a guy in his tracks while they're training, and he's just like, "No, just keep training." Yeah. Oh, he, someone else wants to train. I cool. mean, Let's I remember <laughs> one time he said, "Like, oh, I'm kind of tired." I mean, he said that, but. He didn't say I'm done rolling. You, you know, didn't say like you. you look tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but then, yeah, awesome. That's what I think. Awesome. Uh, all right. Any other questions from Echo Charles? No, that's it. We can um, we can go to support. You know, let's if, wrap if, it up. You know? How can they support? If you want to support, this is how you can. You know, we talk about getting after it a lot from time to time. Um, <laughs> And supplementation is not a form of weakness. Would you agree, Tony? I would agree. Right? Supplement, right? Best supplements, because nowadays supplements can be kind of whack. On it, fortunately. Someone uh, on Twitter was asking me about uh, Shroom Tech. Shroom Tech. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, how does it work and all this stuff? Here's the thing. This is, I know that it helps, or I've heard from Credible Source, that it helps with oxygen uh, utilization. So, you know, like high intensity that you, that kind of goes prolonged or whatever. But you can read on it on the website. They have all the, like, the actual literature, like the tests yep. and all this stuff, on, on all this stuff. Anyway, so it's legit. We all know it's legit. I think that's kind of common knowledge by now. You can get 10% off if you want supplements. On it.com slash Jocko. Just go slash Jocko. 
get a warrior bar as well. My my suggestion. A lot of good stuff on there. Next way, Amazon. So if you shop on Amazon, like we all do, click through the website, our website, jockopodcast.com. There's a little link there, a little banner on the on the side. And uh, you know, go through Amazon or go to Amazon through there. And of course, <laughs> subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and YouTube. Still more videos to come, by the way. Yeah. And of course, Jocko Store. If you like any shirts that we um, we have, we did it. I think we expended a lot of mental energy making sure that the shirts are good to go, as they say, <laughs> or as you would say, kind of dope. Kind of dope, yeah. Kinda but dope. Uh, <laughs> dope meaning not just hey, they're dope because we said so. We try to put different layers on them. You know, you know how uh, it's not like it just says, "Hey, I'm cool," or I don't know, whatever. It's it it says something, and then there it means something as well. Right. Where if you don't know what it means, you just don't know. That's one layer you don't know about it. You know, <laughs> this one has a couple layers, sometimes three. <laughs> just saying, they're not just normal sh- and their quality as well. Just saying, they're good. Anyway, you can uh, judge for yourself as far as how they look. JockoStore.com. If you like them, go ahead and get a shirt. Support that way, or a mug. Or a sticker, whichever. Or a rash guard. Or a rash guard, yes. So, new things. Rash guard, if you didn't know already, rash guards are good. Biking, diving, swimming, surfing, bodyboarding, CrossFit, any kind of Olympic lifting where you need mobility. Is, it's actually better than cotton shirts. They like, you know what I mean? And jujitsu. Last but not least, and jiu-jitsu. the jujitsu. <laughs> Andy did good, and today, yeah, Andy won his big super Andy, fight. Big Andy, you know, Burke representing. Yeah, it wasn't a super fight; it was a bracket, by the way. Oh, I thought it was yeah. a super fight heel against hook, Amir. Decision, heel hook. Dang, Andy representing, <laughs> and uh, yeah, he did in fact have Trooper Rashka. See, uh, what we were talking about—the seventeen, what was seventeen to nineteen percent yeah. improvement, improvement in, in your uh, jiu-jitsu performance. skills. Yeah, and uh, in wow. My, in my uh, bro science like opinion, I think that applies to all physical activity when you wear this rash guard. I, I'm I'm a believer. I'm, and for those of you that don't know, uh, Echo Charles does have a doctorate in bro science. Yeah, so. well, I'm working on it. <laughs> and um, okay, so new stuff. Uh, also, we have patches. I have Velcro, the Velcro ones. You know, the, like this kind, okay, yep. Antonia. Um, and then women's stuff as well. Their tank tops. I, okay, I got you. We're gonna do t-shirts as well. Thank you, Lisa, for the um, the nudge, you know. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, there it is. That's the stuff. Maybe some more some more cool stuff. You know, the seasons are changing, so we'll put some more stuff on there if you guys like. It's cold. Need some warm gear. Potentially. Let's get it done. Yeah. But there it is. Yeah. Support. And thanks for everyone with the, the, the who has supported. That's dope. If you want to get some of this goodness right here, a little bit of uh, pomegranate white tea available. On Amazon.com, Jocko White Tea, the only thing I drink other than water and <laughs> milk. <laughs> so jump on the train. Also, if you haven't got a copy of Extreme Ownership yet, which me and my brother Leif Babin wrote, which has a ton of Tony, who you heard from tonight, a ton of Tony in there. Anytime you're hearing about the Charlie Platoon Chief or Charlie Platoon doing this, or Char- that's the guy who was running it and <laughs> making it happen. Uh, you can pick up the hard copy, digital copy, or the audio book and that Leif and I actually read in October 20th and 21st in San Diego, California. If you're a leader or you want to be a leader, come on out to the Extreme Ownership Muster where we're going to teach the principles of combat leadership and we're going to get in the weeds on the tactics of how to actually employ them. It's one thing to know them, but you got to know how to employ them on the battlefield on the street, in the business world, or in life. So register and then come and get it. And as always, if you want to keep kicking it with us, Echo Charles and myself, we're all up on the interwebs. Twitter, Instagram, and that facebook <laughs> <laughs> Uh Echo Charles is at Echo Charles. I'm at Jocko Willink. I don't think Tony has any of that stuff. No, I don't. Do Too busy BTF. And yeah, I ain't got no time for it. BTF.com. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just don't contact me. Dot com. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to all the motivated troopers out there, especially first off, those in uniform, military, 
law enforcement, firefighters, EMTs. Thanks for what you all do. Thanks for working hard, for training hard, for living hard, and for fighting hard, and for holding the line. And the rest of you folks out there, the rest of you troopers in the workforce attacking your daily struggles, smashing obstacles, keep doing what you're doing and doing it with focus and some ferocity. And finally to Tony, thanks again, my brother, for coming on the show. Thanks for the years you put in training, fighting, and leading. Thanks for always being there to support me no matter what. No Roger. matter what. Yes, sir. Thanks for what you did for me, for the task unit, for the teams, for the Navy, and for the United States of America. And you know, Tony is one of the many veterans from every war who remains in the shadows, who seeks no glory, who did what he did as his duty for country and for his brothers on his left and on his right. So to all of you veterans like Tony, the true quiet professionals, thanks to you warriors who have set the example of how to serve and of course how to get after it so until next time this is echo and jocko and the original btf (laughs) tony afratti thanks brother ditto enough said check roger roger out.